for one. So, but um, I, I wanted to give this talk so that we, as we have people from many different backgrounds, so that you at least uh, see uh, the kind of uh, motivation of uh, why we are looking into these things. So we are looking into the quantum emitter dynamics when you couple emitters to this kind of topological photonic environments. Uh, and what I will try to give is a, a little bit of motivation to the field of how I entered into the topic and what kind of new things you can expect from these topological photonic environments. So this is a work that I started a few years ago, mostly I started with Miguel actually, with the chairman. Um, and I have working now with many different people and I have here highlighted basically the main uh, people that of the work that I will discuss during this talk. Um, so, let's see, yes. So already in free space, so we know that, uh, I mean, uh, photons can mediate interaction among quantum emitters because emitters, uh, atoms have optical transitions. So if you have an atom in the excited state, it can decay a photon uh, to a single photon and propagate to another atom and then exchange interactions. And in particular, one of the terms that you can get are kind of this coherent exchange interactions that, for example, Antoine was discussing during his talk in the, in the first session. The problem is that, I mean, these interactions are very interesting because in principle, you can do entangling gates with them. Uh, you can use them for quantum simulation uh, and so on. But the problem is that in free space, uh, by default, these interactions are also accompanied by uh, other terms, uh, in particular by dissipative terms. So the, the photon eventually can not arrive to the other atom, but can eventually fly away. And this gives rise to non-unitary dynamics. Uh, also to some collective dissipative terms that this could be interested because they give rise to super subradians. Uh, but also another thing is that in free space, I mean, these interactions are typically kind of generally weak uh, and they have a limited strength and range. So you cannot do much. I mean, you have the free space photonic bath and the interaction have this shape that, for example, this Paloma was writing in, in, in the, her talk, uh, these dipole-dipole interactions uh, uh, for the green, space, uh, green function propagator in free space. So uh, there are a lot of kind of quantum optical implementations now in the cavity QED with sensing or with river atoms, as we saw, that can solve partly these problems. Like, for example, we saw the, in the talk of Antoine Broadways, how by making this uh, increasing the dipole moment of atoms, uh, uh, you can increase a lot of interaction strength. Uh, also in cavities, by confining the light to, uh, to a small volume, you can also naturally increase the matter interactions. But also you don't have, I mean, the full flexibility or to tune these interactions that maybe you would like to have uh, for, let's say, quantum simulation to simulate uh, complex models in uh, complex many body physics. So this is why in the last few years, we, I mean, we and many people have been thinking of alternatives. And one of the alternatives is to try to put emitters. I mean, I mean we thought initially about kind of uh, atomic physics uh, close to nanophotonic structures, but it can be any type of emitters close to these uh, dielectric photonic crystal structures. Uh, and there are several motivations to do so. I mean, the first is that because the light in these materials are confined to a subwavelength scale, so they can be confined. Uh, so this naturally increases light matter interaction. So there is a, I mean, if you put an emitter in a proper way close to this structure, there's a lot of probability, let's say, that the emitter couples to the guided photons here. Also, on top of that, um, the fact that the light is confined into, to a lower dimension can also, I mean, naturally that increases uh, the range of the interactions because basically the feed doesn't have to propagate in, in the whole solid angle, like in 3D, but now it propagates either in 2D or 1D. And also, and um, could be the most important thing for kind of this, this talk and this conference, is that the, you, by putting, uh, designing the geometry of these holes of these dielectric functions, you can really tune the, the, the band structure, the emergent band structure, and in particular, uh, for what will be of interest in this in this conference is that you can also have like topological photonic band structures, no, that we have seen. Um, there are now many other systems. I mean, there is the system that have been discussed already a little bit uh, in the first session that is trying to put emitters and interface them with this kind of photonic crystal structures. But I wanted to open a little bit the focus to say that there are also other systems that try to mimic. So they are not really optical uh, systems. Like for example, you have couple microwave resonators where you can mimic the physics of this waveguide QED physics and emitters coupled to them, but just in the microwave regime. There are also these quantum metamaterials that were also mentioned by, by Paloma, where you have a subwavelength atomic arrays and you can also add magnetic fields and you have also topological photonic models here. And also something that maybe is not so well known in this community is that also you can simulate this kind of light matter interaction in a structured photonic baths uh, with purely cold atoms, just by making what they call this state-dependent optical lattices, which is just 
making two lattices for two internal atomic states in such a way that one of them plays the role of the emitter, the other one of the photon. And like this, by I mean, this has already been used to explore kind of wave by QED physics actually in 1D in this experiment here. But given that they, there is a lot of control also to simulate topological models uh, in all that, also one can think that one can use these systems as well to, uh, to explore this physics. So the question that we've been asking is what kind of, actually, and this talk we try to answer, what kind of new quantum optical phenomena uh, in terms of spontaneous emission or especially photomedic interactions uh, emerge when you couple the emitters to these topological photonic isolator models uh, or topology, um, yeah, so these five photonic structures, as you will see. Uh, and, the, and in principle, actually, I mean, what, there is one obvious way of thinking is try to put the emitters coupled to the edge modes that appear in the system. But what I will mostly focus is about trying to put the emitters in, in the bulk and try to see whether, uh, even if the emitters are like a local probe in this bulk that uh, is able to be uh, to become sensitive to the topology of the, of the environment. Uh, before like explaining the talk, so I wanted to make some adver advertisement of some talks that uh, I have been also involved, like the, the talk of actually the chairman, Miguel Bello, that we'll talk tomorrow uh, about the, some work that we did exploring uh, with QED physics, like in the photonic analog of the SSH model. Also the experiment done at the group of uh, Caltech, uh, Postcard Painter, that will be presented by Eugene Kim. And also a poster that will be presented by Carlos Vega, where we try to explore now where you go to more general models which have larger winding numbers uh, by adding long range hoppings to these uh, WebKQ setups. Uh, but what I will focus mostly today is not about the 1D setups that are all this work here, but what happens in higher dimensions. And in particular, what happens with Dirac and biophotonic environments that have this type of uh, energy dispersion that we are almost all aware, of, especially the one of Dirac, no, where you have a singular band touchings with linear dispersion around it uh, that are also have some non-trivial topological properties. And see what kind of uh, physics emerges when you place emitters now energetically uh, in resonance this kind of points. So um, to explain a little bit, so the outline, I will try to make a very brief introduction of what one can expect in, in a standard photonic band gaps, so that in trivial photonic band gaps, so uh, the physics of uh, quantum electrodynamics of light matter interactions there. And then I will explain what happens in these two dimensional Dirac uh, photons uh, systems and also then in the, the biophotonic environments. So, uh, in general, I mean, the physics of this uh, quantum electrodynamics in, in photonic band gaps was explored and um, started being explored in the 90s by uh, Sajid Jovan co workers. I mean, there are a few other works. Uh, also by some other people. But uh, in these works, I mean, they were kind of some of the seminal works in this, in this area. What they realize is that if you put an emitter and you make that the optical transition of the emitter lies uh, uh, around a band edge. So you have here the optical transition. Here you have a band and it lies in a band gap. So you see that the spontaneous emission gets strongly renormalized. So if you are, for example, deep in the band gap, then you expect like, to have no decay because there is no density of states in which you can decay here. And as you are getting closer and closer, you, you see that what happens is something like very curious is this, what they call this fractional decay, that the, the emitter is in a superposition between decaying and not decaying. So this, this physics of the fractional decay or this spontaneous emission near photonic band gaps can be understood in a very intuitive way uh, uh, because, uh, due to the formation of, uh, because what is happening is the formation of what they call the atom photon bound state. So actually what happens is that the emitter is trying to decay, but because the photon cannot propagate because of destructive interference, it localizes around the emitter, forming actually a superposition between having the atom in the excited state and then a photonic component in the bath, but with the shape is kind of exponentially localized around the emitter, so basically. Uh, the length of this bound state actually depends, it's not unique, depends on the, 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 the tuning between the emitter position, uh, emitter frequency with respect to the bandage. And also what you can see is that the, what is also important is that the, this finite value of, the, um, of this fractional decay dynamics is basically very dependent of the overlap of this bound state with your initial excited state. No? Actually, this is what I call this overlap between the, the bound state and the, and the initial excited state. And this is what gives you this finite value here. I mean, this was kind of, um, I mean, with a single emitter, it's more kind of a curiosity. Uh, but what is interesting and what I think uh, raised a lot of interest in the last years is that now if you don't consider a single emitter, but you put many, 
you can see that actually the, the effective dynamics uh, that is obtained when you adiabatically eliminate the photonic modes that typically is described with this effective master equation, you can see actually that these dissipative terms coming from the, uh, uh, from a, the spontaneous emission or collective decays will vanish because of course you have no density of states if you put the emitter at these band, band gap frequencies. And then you end up with a purely coherent exchange, uh, a dipole-dipole exchange, again, like, like the one that Antoine Brown was, was mentioning when he was implementing this photonic SSH model. But with the advantage is that, that because the, 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 this interaction is mediated by the bound state, now it can be controlled through the length, this effective length of the bound state that I was explaining before. So just by controlling the detuning between the emitter and the optical transition, you can really tune the shape of these emitter-emitter interactions. Something important, I mean, in general, when the, you are deep in the band gap, this overlap is actually very close to one, so this doesn't matter. And then what you end up is with some uh, interaction that is, has some function that depends on, the, uh, uh, depends on the dimension. So for example, in the case of 1D, it's kind of constant. But then somehow the price you are paying for canceling this spontaneous emission in these uh, photonic environments is to have an exponential localization of this, actually. Uh, so, I mean, this is what we found uh, in this, well, I mean, this is a paper by the group of Gary. This is mine, I was focused on 2D. Uh, uh, but actually, since I made this paper, what I've been wor wondering is whether I can go beyond this paradigm. I could have, for example, uh, more exotic shapes in terms of the uh, atom photon bound state shapes that then will translate into, into interaction. Also, whether I could avoid this exponential localization uh, uh, and this trade off between the exponential localization and the cancellation of a spontaneous emission. And also, I mean, one of the problems with respect to free space interaction, with respect to the one that where you have a material is that typically they, they are sensitive to the solder. And in principle, you would be able, I mean, you would like to, to have some robustness to, to the solder. No? And this is more or less where you see that the topology could, could uh, help. So what I will go now is to discuss two different type of photonic environments where you can somehow go beyond this simple paradigm of these two papers here. So the, the first kind of uh, um, system is this, the one of the Dirac photons. <clears throat> so what I consider is to have an emitter that is coupled to the bulk modes of a, a, a graphene a photonic environment. So where you have a, is a, this graphene photonic analog is just a, a bipartite lattice. You have A base sub lattices, and it's uh, that are described, for example, by some uh, resonator here in this simplified couple resonator model. And each, at, uh, each resonator from each sub lattice is coupled to three nearest neighbor uh, of the other sub lattice. This is what defines this graphene analog simulator. And in this case, they are coupled with the same strength, basically. So this, this band structure can be easily diagonalized and they give rise to the well-known graphene Dirac energy structure. So you have uh, two bands because of the bipartite structure. They are linearly touching at a single point. And here it looks like there is a gap, it's kind of numeric, but of course they are touching at a single point at the K points. And they are linearly dispersive around these points. And now, uh, um, if you translate this, how this, this band structure translates into something that is very important, um, let's say for, for quantum optical features as like the density of states, you see that the, this, uh, this linearly, this singular point here translated also into a singular band gap. So if you calculate the density of states, you see that around the Dirac point, that is this, this frequency here, the band structure has a singular band gap and uh, with a linear energy dispersion here. So the question now is like, if I put an emitter now, basically tune at this uh, frequency, um, so what will happen? And then uh, what happens actually is something quite curious. Um, so there is certain consequences of this singular band gap nature. Uh, so on the one hand, what you see is that if you put the emitter actually um, in the thermodynamic limit, what you observe is actually you decay. So this is something um, quite remarkable because in principle, the density of a state is zero. So in principle, according to Fermi golden rule, shouldn't decay. But actually what happens is that if you look at the structure in, in a little bit more detail, like doing finite size simulations, what happens is that if you diagonalize and try to see if there is a, a one of these qubit photon bound state that I was mentioning before, the answer is that there is one. But actually, if, for example, if you couple the emitter to the A sub lattice, you have a, a, a bound state in the B sub lattice, actually. And the, the wave function of this uh, bound state, however, differently from the other, is not exponentially localized, but actually it decays like one over R. Well, it has, has some anisotropy, but it has globally a one over R decay. 
And this actually uh, makes, it, makes it very peculiar because actually you can prove that, I mean, this kind of bound state is not integrable uh, in, the, in the two dimensions. So which means that actually it does not belong to the, the localized spectrum or the, it belongs to the scattering spectrum. And this is the reason why initially the overlap of this bound state with respect to the initial state it goes to zero and eventually you decay. Basically, that's kind of the reason why you have this kind of non Markovian decay. However, in finite systems, in this isotropic configuration, uh, you, you have uh, an intermediate situation in which what you see, and this is a figure of the uh, this is the population decay of the excited emitter as a function of time for different system sizes. So you see, like this is the larger system size, you see that this logarithmic decay is actually very slow. But if you go to a smaller system, you see that at some point the evolution quenches and it start oscillating around a constant value. Uh, and, and then actually the question would be uh, like now, if you put maybe maybe more than two emitters, I mean, will they be able to talk about from this uh, kind of uh, localized uh, state or not? I mean, because this kind of uh, it has this quasi bound state nature, so it's not so obvious whether it will be able to decay or not. And the, the, the answer, I and mean, this is what I was saying, the overlap actually decreases with system size, but does it very slowly. And if you put two emitters, actually you can see that actually you get perfect coherent chain oscillation. So actually they will be able to interact. And actually you can prove that the interactions follow this one over R shape. So they are not exponentially attenuated. So in this sense, you get the best of the, of the two worlds. Uh, and then the, uh, you don't get the, the, this exponential uh, attenuation. But the price you are paying is that actually if you look because this overlap with this bound state depends on system size, eventually in the thermodynamic limit, they will not be able to interact coherently. So actually the, 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 the advantage here is that the, the, the dependent is so weak, because this logarithmic dependent with system size, it will allow you to, to, to talk. Uh, however, uh, also another price that you are paying, and here I put it in quotation marks or with a question mark, is whether you are losing some tunability, no? because before somehow you could control the range of the interaction uh, with the, the tuning with system size, but somehow you don't have this no. And I put here in kind of question mark, because one of the last thing that we were looking is that uh, it is also known that if you have an anisotropic Dirac point, so let's say that you have this uh, bipartite lattice, but you have a weakest or a strongest uh, tight binding link here. Uh, then what is known is that actually the, the, the Dirac points can move within the Brillouin zone and they are only annihilated until you merge two of them that have the opposite winding number. No? You have this, bound, uh, this Dirac point have a winding number each of them that uh, they are in pairs, so they have a plus and minus sign so that the overall chain number is kind of trivial. But actually, I mean, uh, there is some kind of freedom uh, and well, this was pointed out some long time ago. But this is kind of interesting because, for example, if you look at the density of states, uh, what happens is that actually you can increase this, this uh, anisotropic parameter from 1 to 2, well, 2.1 here. And the 2 is a critical value where basically the two Dirac's point merge at the, at the same point of the unit cell, and they give rise to what they call a semi-Dirac uh, band touching. That is basically is kind of plotted here. It's quadratic in one direction and, and uh, linear in the other. And also it changes the nature of this bound uh, of this density of a state at the singular point. Uh, so actually what we study is what are the consequences in this qubit photon bound state shapes. And of course, you see that um, if you calculate the shape of this bound state shape, you see that you go for this kind of isotropic one over R shape. And then you, as you increase the anisotropy, you see that the things start deviating. At the critical point, you get this very highly anisotropic kind of decay. And then also this remains also when you open the band gap. So when you open the band gap, of course, this gets an exponential localization, uh, but also it remains this anisotropy. This is also actually kind of reminiscent of some recent experiment by the group of Alberto Amo and Jacqueline Block, where they were exploring this semi-direct transport now with a, a polarity of honeycomb lattices, actually, and they were observing something similar. So in our case, we were interested also about this interplay with this, this overlap with this bound state or whether, I mean, I mean this asymptotic shape of the uh, special decay of this bound state changes. And this is what we do is study more detail here. So we plot a cut of this bound state in, along this diagonal so that we can capture also the, the decay here. And then what we observe is that actually the decay, even though it looks like here you are getting a different shape, but if you plot the decay of this uh, along this diagonal, you see that they maintain the one over R shape for all the para uh, anisotropy parameters until this phase transition, until this critical point where it changes from having from being one over R to one over square root of R. 
So this would say that you will have a way of having a longer range hopping, but on the contrary, what we also found is that uh, the system uh, also have uh, this overlap with this bound state goes to zero exactly at this critical focal point, irrespective of the uh, basically of system size actually. So you have no coherent interactions eventually. So eventually in this case, you will have this uni non-unitary dynamics kind of collective dissipation that would be anisotropic that you cannot harness it to have this collective uh, decays at this critical point. At the other point, yes, you will have these dipole-dipole interactions. Uh, then uh, I wanted to talk about the, uh, this uh, uh, biophotonic environments um, in 3D. So biophotonics is kind of a 3D analog of Dirac points. Uh, so they are also singular band touches that are linearly dispersing around, around these points. So they occur when you have a, a I mean, a, basically a, a cubic lattice, for example, and you break either inversion symmetry or time reversal symmetry. You have to break one of them in order to have them. Uh, so they have been observed kind of quite recently, uh, uh, for example, in a couple like in these microwave uh, resonators in a very complex structures. Uh, what we use to analyze them is not this kind of complex photonic structures. What we will use is a type binding model inspired by some uh, proposal by the group of Ketterle and Sojacic uh, that they were defining uh, basically a nearest neighbor couple resonator model as well. I mean, it was inspiring in a cold atom setup, but you can think of it as a couple resonator model. And the way you get, they get the by points is by adding some staggered hopping term between the two sublattices at the set direction. So they have that uh, minus, J, uh, minus sign for uh, when the n plus n was basically even or odd. Uh, I mean, this model, because of this breaking of inversion symmetry, have these four by points. And you could also add a, a Nestager energy mass term and a Nestager energy difference between the two uh, by points, because actually what you can show is that the by points are also have, have this kind of topological protection. So they are kind of monopoles of the very curvature. And also they only get annihilated when two of them of opposite chirality meet uh, in the region zone. And to get this movement before we were using this anisotropy, uh, in this case, you can do this, you see this, this stagger mass hopping attempt in order to move the band structure. However, there will be important differences between the two situations. As I said, like here, like if you break inversion symmetry, you have this band touching at four, four by points. They are sources of the very curvature um, uh, and they are monopoles actually. And then they, uh, they can move if you may move this parameter n. Uh, and actually you can prove that the, the, you have a parabolic singular band gap I mean, this is the density of states as a function of this parameter m. So you have a parabolic with n equal to zero, you have a parabolic band gap. And this remains the same until a critical point, that is when the absolute value of this m is equal to 2j, where the, this um, uh, band gap opens. And actually, it distinguishes between a topologically, a topologically insulated situation in three dimensions, when you have this uh, m is have a positive sign, and a trivial one when you have a negative sign, actually. So this is also like this by point can be thought as a, a let's say semi-metallic phase, like the edge modes between these two uh, topologically non-trivial phases. Uh, phases, yes. <clears throat> and then, of course, the same kind of Gedanken experiment we do is the same. So what if we couple an emitter in the bulk of one of these photonic bile environments? And then we see uh, what happened with this qubit photon bowel state, say. So what you see here is that actually, the, the, for example, with the m equal to zero parameter, so the thing is kind of also isotropically localized around the emitter. And if you make a specific cuts of this bound state shape along the different directions, this is in the x, y direction and in the c direction, see so that they decay like with a power law. Now in this case, it's one over d squared. So this is a slightly longer range than the, than the free space ones. That would be like one over d uh, to a three to in the near field. And then if you move this parameter m, what you can change is again the shape of this bound state. And in particular, what, what I find remarkable is that you can really get different values uh, of the, well, in different directions of the, uh, of the power law exponent by tuning this parameter m. Because actually differently from the, the, the other one, you really change like the, the band structure around, the, around these, these, these by points. So uh, this is the point that we make here that the, thanks to this topological protection of the by points, somehow this power law decay can be tuned uh, to, well, to a certain extent. So it's not that you can tune to a lot of value, but you really can change the shape of this bound state without opening the band gap and without therefore having this exponential localization. 
Well, we can well, calculate the thing with disorder to see if this power law survives. And of course, it survives as long as you are far from this value where you have this critical, I mean, this critical value where that it opens a bank up. So this is robustness to that amount of disorder. And if you calculate the coherent oscillations now differently from the wild point, so you really see that you get a, a, a overlap with the bound state that is independent of system size and you get very robust coherent oscillations actually. So it's a really a, not a quasi bound state, but it's a true quasi qubit photon bound state in this situation. And in the last two minutes, I, I want to say that, I mean, one of the interesting things of these bile points also, or well, one of the way that it connects into experiments is that if you have a finite system, you know, if you are not worried about the bulk, but in the finite system, what happens is that uh, the, the, it emerges surface modes, like topologically protected surface modes. Like you know, now you have edge modes that are, uh, because you have a three-dimensional reservoir. Um, and then actually in the uh, in the semi-metallic phase, so when you have bile points, this, these bile points are, uh, so the signature of the bile physics is the appearance of what they call these Fermi arcs that connect the bile points of opposite chirality in the visual zone. And it's typically the smoking gun of by Fermi of physics is the typical thing that they detect, for example, with ARPES when they did the uh, electronic, uh, the, the discovery of by fermions uh, in electronic systems. So what we have explored is now, okay, so if I put an emitter again now in the surface, so what will happen, uh, we like, of course, I mean, I will be able to couple even this a local probe to, to this kind of Fermi arcs and whether I will be able to detect them. And actually, well, this is kind of a, a particular uh, choice of this, uh, I mean, finite system. In our case, we see these bile points, so these Fermi arcs in making the projection of the brilliant zone. And actually, if you put the emitter and you wait for a certain time, you really see the emission into, into the edge mode. So this is really emitting in the surface, so you don't couple to the bulk modes. And you have this shape that actually doesn't tell you much about the Fermi arc. It's kind of the real space distribution. But actually, we are working that how to basically now collect light from the system. And you can show that actually, if you collect light in the far field, you are kind of making a Fourier transform of, of this spontaneous emission decay in real space. And you really can have access to the, this kind of Fermi arcs that are appearing in the uh, uh, finite system in this energy dispersion through the emission of these uh, modes uh, here. Well, there is a number of assumptions to, to do these calculations, but uh, OK, so we will write them uh, soon. Uh, but I mean, the, the kind of message is that actually by an emitter can be kind of a proof of this kind of models if you then afterwards collect the light out of it. So with that, just the summary uh, is that I think that there is a very nice, uh, well, a lot of physics to explore by like, like connecting the physics of quantum optics, quantum emitters coupled to these topological photonic models. In particular, I have discussed mostly the, the shape of these novel photomediative interactions in 2D and 3D. In the next talks, we'll also discuss 1D and 2D settings. And now, I mean, what we can also explore is what I know, for example, applications in, what, in terms of what kind of novel many body faces. And I think Miguel will talk something about it in, the, in his talk tomorrow. And also we have used this, for example, this long range photometry interactions to, to simulate quantum chemistry problems of so this paper here. So I think that there are nice applications of these things. So with that, let me thank you for your attention and uh, uh, be able to ask any questions. Okay, Alejandro, thank you very much. Um, all right, uh, Berta, let me unmute you. Okay, thank you. I just, I don't know how to raise my hand. I'm really sorry. <laughs> okay, I think in reactions. Okay, okay. Um, my question is about what is topological really in what you are uh, showing and how much it's actually related exclusively to the density of states? Because, uh, for, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. go ahead, go ahead. So this is the question. Yes, uh, so for example, the dynamics, uh, I think is mostly related to the density of the states. Basically, the, for example, when you calculate the, the dynamics of the um, uh, decay of uh, an emitter in the Dirac point that you have this logarithmic decay, this is ex ex exclusively coming from the density of the states. Uh, I think what is coming from the topology, or I mean, the kind of thing is that uh, first, uh, this kind of bound state, uh, qubit photon bound state, because the photonic component, and actually you will hear more in the next talk, I think, by Francesco, you can prove that actually this photonic component is very much related to the edge modes of topological kind of, uh, of the topological photonic system. So uh, in this sense, this is really an effect coming from the topology, this robustness to the solid that this bound state have, that they don't have like the, the the other cases. Uh, and also, in the case of wild photonic physics, I mean, this fact that 
uh, I mean that, that this, these bile points are topologically protected because they cannot be annihilated until two of them with the other one in number matches on top of each other. I would also say that this is associated to the topology. Regarding the, the dynamics, for example, I mean, it's completely related to the density of the state. Okay, I think there is time for one more question. So Alejandro Bermudez, you can uh, ask it yourself if you want. All right, if not, I, I will say it myself. Um, Alejandro asks, uh, what happens to all these effects if your emitter frequency is not exactly fine tuned to, to the middle of the gamma band gap, I guess, to the singular band gap, uh, but to an epsilon to-, to Yes, that. yes. So actually what you see is that, um, because of course, I mean, if you move this energy to a density of states, uh, so you will have a start having decay. So you will start having, for example, not purely coherent oscillations. You will start seeing some decay. However, because the, uh, you can prove that the, the real part of this, <clears throat> uh, this dipole dipole interactions uh, is larger than the one that you have the imaginary part. Still, uh, if you are not very far, uh, the coherent evolution is able to dominate still. And this is actually the reason why you observe the things when you have two emitters, no? because when you have two emitters and they are interacting through dipole-dipole, they are split, so they are not exactly at the same energy. They have a symmetric and antisymmetric superposition, and this enters into the continuum. But still, you are able to observe the oscillations because actually the amount of imaginary parts somehow that you acquire of non-unitary dynamics is smaller than the coherent part. So still, you will be able to observe that part. OK. All right, so thank you very much, Alejandro. Yes. Um, our next speaker is Francesco Sicarello. Uh, so he will talk about topologically protected atom photon dress states. And so, Francesco, the stage is yours. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. You see the screen, right? Yeah, we also see the miniatures on the left. So yeah, okay, probably. And now? Yeah. That's okay, you don't see the miniature? No. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction. And thanks a lot to the organizers for inviting me to this exciting workshop. So I think that now we have this introduction part and Alejandro actually said uh, quite a lot of things. But let me just uh, briefly sketch the, uh, the arena where this um, work is set in. So uh, roughly speaking, uh, the, uh, the field is uh, maybe with some abuse of language called waveguide QED. And actually this is a subfield of waveguide QED uh, studying the interaction with, of quantum emitters. Uh, I, I will be talking about atoms, but of course they can be also artificial atoms uh, superconducting qubits and uh, some of the systems Alejandro already talked about. So this subfield study is uh, interact the coupling of these uh, quantum emitters to structure for photonic bath and uh, mostly lattices. So actually um, uh, this, uh, this physics uh, was first predicted uh, back in the 90s uh, by Sayev John. Uh, you could see some citations of his works uh, in, the, in the Alejandro's talk. But over the last few years, uh, the, there was, there was the, uh, this, this, this topic received a lot of, of attention. I would say that um, the central effect, uh, uh, one of the a major effect uh, it relies on is the fact that as you already heard, uh, when you have a quantum emitter, you, you couple it to a photonic lattice and you tune uh, the atomic frequency, which I'll be calling uh, throughout the talk omega naught inside the band gap. Then, if it is not too far from the band edge, a uh, dressed atom photon bound state will be seeded at a frequency close, not equal, but close in general to the atomic frequency. And as you already heard, the photonic wave function exponentially localized uh, around the atom. And um, these states are appealing uh, because uh, you can uh, rely on them in order to implement uh, 
automaton decoherence free interesting spin Hamiltonians, uh, in which case uh, you have uh, many atoms uh, uh, with the uh, mm, Photonic wave functions of these bound states slightly overlapping. Uh, there were already a lot of experiments. So you already saw some of these in various setups, in particular superconducting setups. Um, okay, now um, at some point, of uh, it, it became natural to think of what happens when you couple quantum emitters to photonic lattice having some topological properties. And the first, maybe one of the first natural things you can think of is coupling atoms to edge states, uh, in the case, for instance, of the SSH photonic lattice, and use these edge states in, as an effective bus to transfer quantum states between the atoms. You can do this in 1D or in 2D. Uh, there are some works here cited where you can see, for instance, effects such as carrier emission when you couple a quantum emitter to a photonic lattice, uh, topological photonic lattice, as we heard already this morning in one of the talks, or even state transfer mediated by uh, topologically protected edge modes. Now, um, I think that um, a new paradigm, paradigm has been established uh, about three years ago in this paper by the chairman, Alejandro, and other people. So the difference is that, unlike the previous cases where you had, where you couple uh, the meters to pre existing edge modes, such that uh, the photonic lattice was already, uh, was, was not, uh, was, was an open one, and uh, was subject to open boundary conditions. Now you couple quantum emit, uh, quantum, the quantum emitter to a photonic lattice, which is translational invariant, or if you, if you want, you couple the meter to the bulk. So this means that it is the coupling with the atom itself that breaks the trans translational invariance. So what they saw in the um, simple instance, uh, you know, familiar instance of SSH model, which we already saw many times this morning, is that when you tune the atom, uh, you see the pointer, right? When you, yes. Okay. When you when you tune the uh, the atomic frequency right in the middle of the bang up, then addressed uh, atom photon state uh, is seeded, um, which has this general form, and you can see that this is topologically protected. Now this was uh, even experimentally observed uh, last year, and uh, you will uh, will hear I think again about these experiments tomorrow or one of the next talks. Okay, now there comes uh, uh, the natural question. And the question is, is uh, what about other topological models? Is this uh, model dependent or not? And so general natural questions are, um, what are the general criterions then for occurrence of such topologically protected atom photon dress states? And uh, what are their general properties? And these were basically our main motivations. Okay, you have two important clues already from the SSH. First clue is that, as I said, you, um, you get these topologically protected dress states when you tune the atom or resonance uh, with the middle of, uh, of the bang up. And then remarkably, um, the dress state itself has the same energy as the atom. And this is true, whatever the coupling strengths. So if you tune the coupling strengths, the atomic and photonic components will generally be different, uh, but remarkably, the energy of the dress state remains is, uh, is pinned to the energy, to the bare energy of the atom. This is a bit unusual. I mean, if you think of, uh, you know, familiar dress states such as those arising in the James Cummings model, where you expect that when you uh, change the coupling, also the frequency of the dress state will change. Then the second clue is that um, the photonic wave function that uh, you see in the SSH case is basic, is, is, a, is, a, is basically the, as basically the same shape as the as the as the edge state that you get when you take your SSH photonic lattice and uh, replace 
one of the atom with a vacancy. You see exactly the same kind of photonic wave function. And you see appearance of, an edge of a topologically protected edge state right in the middle of the bang up. So we use basically these two clues in order to build up a theory. And this theory basically ended up in identifying a class of atom photon dress states that to the best of my knowledge uh, was kind of, uh, um, and went kind of unnoticed so far. So uh, in order to define these states, we considered a very general, a very generic model where you have uh, an atom, a uh, two-level atom coupled to an unspecified photonic lattices, uh, here discretized. Uh, and so you can think of these uh, as, um, um, as a set of coupled cavities. Uh, uh, you can have uh, whatever uh, whatever couplings between the cavities. Uh, you can have uh, any number of cavities, not necessarily a thermodynamically large number. And you have the uh, atom coupled to the lattice at a uh, site, namely a cavity V, uh, under the usual R RWA coupling. Okay. So. In this case, a generic dress state is, of, of course, look like this and features uh, uh, single photon states. So I'm, I'm focusing on uh, single photon dress states. Okay, now we define vacancy like a vacancy like dress states in a very simple way. A very a vacancy like dress state is just a single photon dress state forming at, this, at exactly the same energy as the atom. You see that we have in both cases these omega knots. Then through a one line proof, it takes really a second to see that this property is equivalent to saying that you have a, a node of the field on the, on, the, on the location of the atom, namely the cavity which the atom is directly coupled to. These two things can be proven to be equivalent. So saying that the dress state forms the same energy as the atom and saying that the photonic wave function of the dress states as a node on the atom's location are equivalent statements. And now you ask, you wonder how uh, does one such state look like? Uh, oh, uh, uh, let me just point out that the fact that the, the wave fu function as a, as a node on the atom's location suggests that uh, you can replace the, uh, the atom that the atom behaves as if a vacancy uh, were in its place. Okay. Now general properties. It is conv convenient to define the, uh, uh, another bath, which is the same bath as before with the cavity directly coupled to the atom replaced by vacancy. And I call this, uh, this bath BV. Now, of course, since, uh, as, as I just said, the photonic wave function of the dress state uh, has a node on the on V, then this wave function fully lives uh, uh, in this BV. Hmm? And there is more. It is even an eigenstate of the free Hamiltonian of this uh, lattice B of this uh, bath BV, again with the same energy as the atom. And now you wonder. Why, when does such states get formed? And another one line, one line proof, actually all these one line proofs, you get all these one line proofs by just considering the Schrodinger equation and projecting it on the, these states, uh, the states where you have uh, the atom in G and the photon everywhere except that in V and then projecting on V. And in the last case, you get this interesting condition, which is this one. And this shows that, so this is the atomic uh, component, the atomic amplitude of the state. This shows basically that if the previous state, so this, this eigenstate of BV exists, then the, uh, the BDS will always exist as well. Let me, let me stress that this, uh, wave this photonic wave function here is not an eigenstate of the bare photonic bath. Is an eigenstate of BB, so not of the true photonic bath. So in fact, this state does not exist. In a way, the presence of the atom induces formation of these states. And so the atom couples to these states, thus seeding the VDS. That's uh, the picture. 
Now, based on this, uh, this guy here, you can even, in the case of bound BDS, work out a general recipe, uh, allowing you to, based, based on the Hamiltonian parameter, uh, infer uh, and the knowledge of, the, of these uh, photonic wave, waves uh, eigenstates of BV to um, infer the, the form of the associated VDS. Now, um, why does this state always exist? And uh, you see that the mechanism is very similar to the mechanism behind formation of well-known north states in atomic in, in quantum optics. Why? It is convenient to use this representation. In this representation, you see, I uh, res rep so this is my atom, this is coupled to B, and uh, B is now seen as the, as the cavity directly coupled to the atom, and all the eigenstates of BV. Now you see that if there is an eigenstate of BV having the same frequency of the atom, then due to this V type configuration by a mechanism entirely analogous to that, uh, giving rise to uh, dark states, for sure you will always have whatever G, a uh, linear combination of the, of the excited state of the atom and these photonic single photon states, which is a saturated state of, of the entire Hamiltonian. This is the reason why you are sure that this comes out. Okay, how much time left? Yeah, you still have 12 minutes left. 12 minutes, okay. So an instance, let me, uh, oh, let me stress that so far I didn't make any assumption on, on, the, on the photonic bath. So it could, it could well, even well be non-topological. Actually, I'm now uh, taking, considering two non-topological instances of VDS. The simplest instance is just uh, uh, the case where B uh, features two cavities, V and one. And you see that in this case, when, the, when one, the, the cavity not directly coupled to the atom has the same frequency as the atom, then for sure a linear superposition of the atom and a single photon sitting only on one will exist, which is a stationary state. This is a simple assistance of VDS. And then let me consider an, um, an instance from WaveGuide QED. So we have the atom coupled to a semi-infinite photonic waveguide, which is here discretized mostly for the sake of, of argument. This can, the waveguide can be seen as an infinite waveguide where you put a mirror on one end, okay? Now, you, uh, now uh, what is BV here? BV is the union of this semi-infinite waveguide on the right of the atom here, and what is in fact an effective cavity between the mirror and the atom on the left of the atom. Now you see that um, if there are uh, cavity modes regarding this effective cavity whose frequency, so if there is one cavity mode, so if one single photon and corresponding single photon against state whose frequency matches that of the atom, then for sure VDS will arise. And this state uh, is a state which has been investigating intensively in the last few years. Uh, it's called the dress beak uh, bound state in the continuum because it's a bound uh, state arising in, uh, because the overall system is gapless. And uh, nicely in this framework, you work out these states by just, uh, just, a simple uh, just a simple textbook calculation of uh, uh, a 1D cavity modes. Okay, now, now let, me, uh, let, let me talk about topological VDS. So here I think uh, that VDS uh, proved their usefulness the most. So um, in fact, uh, this framework provides us with a general scheme for um, building up um, uh, topologically protected atom photon dress states. So you know that you have the, the usual uh, atlan Zimbauer cl uh, cl 10 classes of photonic lattices. Now you see what class your photonic lattice lies in, and then it's known, you can see for instance this reference here, it's known that depending on the, on the class, when you, con when you uh, put a zero dimensional defect in the lattice, and a vacancy is a one zero dimensional defect, you know if there is a, a 
non-zero topological, inv topological invariant. Okay? Because um, in fact, I stress again that the problem is fully reduced to the problem of asking whether a topologically protected uh, bound state arises in the presence of a vacancy, which is a zero-dimensional defect. defect. Then if, the, if you have uh, a topological invariant and this is non-zero, then you know that a bound state will appear in the middle of the gamba, bang gap. And then again, you know now that if you tune the atom or resonance with this state right at the middle of the bang gap, you get a zero mode VDS, which is topologically protected. Okay, and so this is a way to, to uh, get new classes of topologically protected uh, uh, atom photon bound state. And now, of course, uh, you can invoke the theory which Alejandro has been talking about, because based on this VDS, you have associated the atom atom uh, effective Hamiltonian. You can also, based on the previous formula which I gave, you can also work out the general form of atom atom couplings, which is inherited from the form of the, you know, the um, photonic wave function. And, blah, blah. and so this, in this way, you have, in fact, classes of uh, atom atom uh, Hamiltonians, which are topo topologically protected. Now you can ask whether, okay, you can ask if by any chance you can go also the other way around. So the question is, if I have a topologically protected atom photon dress state, is it a, a VDS? And the answer is yes, this can be proven using symmetry arguments. So you see that why VDS is a natural class to think of when you deal with atom photon dress states. Just a few words on the, the, the search of vacancy induced, uh, induced, um, vacancy induced uh, bound states, which the problem reduces to. Um, we could, uh, in the work, we could uh, work, uh, actually, Luca Lomforte, who is the first author, was able to work at a theorem valid for one dimensional lattices, saying that. If uh, R is in, is, in the, in, is the interaction range, so it, we have R equal to one in the case of nearest neighbor couplings, and this is the number of bands, then if R times the edge states exist under open boundary conditions, then you are sure that a vacancy induced bound state, and so possibly a related VDS always exists, and, is a, and it can be obtained as a superposition of those edge states. Okay, we use this theorem uh, to uh, work out uh, VDS class in the case uh, of uh, non necessarily topological in the case of the kreutz ladder photonic lattice, in which case we could infer the general form of a vacancy induced beam, beam uh, bound state, and then um, uh, issuing uh, atom, atom couplings using the previous um, the previous scheme that I've been talking about. So, interesting, these couplings uh, uh, are complex, uh, and in principle, you can tune this space uh, if you have control of uh, the lattice parameters. Then we also apply the, the framework to the case of a two-dimensional photonic lattice, uh, and uh, a natural one to think of was the Haldane model. In the case of Haldane, uh, you have that uh, when you are at this point of the parameter space, or equivalently these other points, then a vacancy uh, will induce a topologically protected bound state. And so if you tune the atom of res on resonance uh, with the, again with the middle of the bang up, you have uh, uh, an associated BDS. Interestingly, um, this at the atom photon dress state features a photon uh, orbiting around the atom. So not only as uh, in, other, in the case of, for instance, a one dimensional bound state, you have the photon, uh, nearby photon uh, localized around the atom, but this photon in this case uh, is also moving, uh, and so persistently circulates around the atom. And so I'm, I'm, I, I've got to the conclusions. So we identified, in, identified in this talk a class of uh, dress states, which we dubbed vacancy-like dress states. Um, this class uh, um, al allows to um, provide a natural framework for interpreting uh, waveguide QD phenomena, such as formation of addressed uh, band in the continuum state 
which I talked about, where atoms be behave as mirrors. Another major phenomenon where uh, atoms behave as mirrors uh, is a well-known uh, perfect reflection of a resonant photon uh, along a wave, uh, one-dimensional waveguide in the presence of an atom. You can also interpret that phenomenon fully in terms of a BDS, which in that case is, a, is an unbound BDS. So BDS are not necessarily bound. You can also have unbound BDS. Then I've shown the uh, key role that VDS turned out to have uh, in topological quantum optics when it comes to topologically protected atom photon dress state. Then some outlook here. Uh, one natural question is what happens when you have, your, for instance, um, two dimensional photonic lattice, uh, topologically invariant, and you have uh, uh, like a row of atoms. And it's natural to think that this row of atoms can behave as a one-dimensional def defect, defect, and so give me rise to a sort of one-dimensional VDS uh, looking like you know, uh, an edge state. Then we would like to explore VDS in non-emission photonic lattice, uh, non-emission topological lattices. And then, uh, oh, okay, this is just a question that came to me uh, when taking a very quick look at, at this preprint. I don't know if, you, if any of you have seen it last week on the archive by Ashida Mamoglu and Daimler. And they present a framework uh, where it turns out that uh, you have many photon generalization of a number of uh, atom photon uh, bound states, including BIC. And so that comes naturally the question where the, there exists many photon generalization of BDS, okay? Finally, let me keep Credit to my two teammates. So we have uh, uh, my PhD student, Luca Lomporte from the University of Palermo. He will uh, be presenting a poster between tomorrow and Friday. And then we have Angelo Carollo, who is an assistant professor at Palermo. And most importantly, my office mate. These two guys are the topologically robust uh, members of the team. And finally, this is just an advertise for some uh, PhD scholarship in our department. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Okay, Francesco, thank you very much. It was very interesting. So uh, Adrian Parra has a question for you. Adrian, can you speak up? I don't know, for some reason, people is very shy. No, you have to unmute him, Miguel. Ah, okay. okay. Is, he's muted. So, Adrian, can you... uh, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, just a very simple question: Like, is it possible to generalize a theory when the coupling with the meter, um, when you cannot apply the rotating wave approximation? Yeah. This, uh, in no, with not the... in a not in a natural way. So, I would say in this respect, I would say that currently this is a linear theory. But uh, I mean, somehow this is connected to the last uh, point in the outlook that I, I've just mentioned about this, this, new, this, pay, this new preprint that came out. But in that case, uh, in fact, you fully change the model. So actually you, don't, you, you, you no longer have uh, um, two level atoms. Uh, it's a fully different model. So I would say that the, the immediate answer is that that is definitely non-trivial. Okay, thank you. Welcome. All right. Uh, are there any more questions? Well, if not, I do have one question. Uh, have you considered what happens when your emitter uh, is coupled to several sides uh, of the bath at the same time? Like, for example, these giant atoms that are now sort of popular? Yes. Uh, uh, actually, this is. Uh, um somehow connected to Lucas poster to two. Um, of course you don't have, uh, in that case, you don't have a vacancy, right? By, because because the, the atom connects to, to, to two sides, right? Mm -hmm. But this, this is actually another outlook that uh, I wonder about. Uh, yeah. Okay. But we have, uh, maybe this is a good chance to say that we have uh, a many atom generalization. You can generalize this to many atoms. And actually, uh, I've been talking about the big states. Uh, you also have uh, many photon, for instance, two, two atom big states. Uh, you can also reproduce them by a natural generalization of the theory to two atoms. 
But in that case, you just have two, two vacancies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm, all right, if there are no more questions, then we can continue. So our next uh, speaker is Peter Ravel, and he will talk about Landau photon pol polaritons. So, yeah. Okay, so just to check, so you can hear me, see me. Yeah. Slide is moving. Okay. The cursor as well. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, okay, so uh, let's thank, first of all, the organizers, uh, especially uh, particular also the, the team in, in Benask. Uh, they are managing this whole uh, online conference. Um, yeah, so, so today I will uh, talk about, the title is London Photon Polaritons, and okay, I will explain a little bit uh, what I mean by that. And just to, to start uh, start with, I mean, this work is really, so the hero of today uh, is, is Daniele De Panaris. He's a PhD student or now finishing soon in a month. Uh, and he did essentially all the calculations here, uh, but also, I mean, this work was done in close collaboration with Jacopo Carosotto and Mohamed Hafezi, um, yeah, with whom we had very interesting discussion and also a lot of the stimulation for this type of work. Good. Um, so the, the meeting is called Topology Meets Quantum Optics. And I think we heard uh, already a lot about topological systems. So one of the type of systems where topology, I think, was, was first discussed uh, are these type of quantum Hall systems. Okay, so you have electrons, 2D electrons and magnetic fields. And then if the field is strong enough, okay, so you have this something like edge states or you have this uh, inductance quantizations here with these very peculiar steps and very precise steps. And uh, at least at some stage, people started to, to think about this. I mean, these are very robust quantities, something that doesn't depend on very detailed uh, behavior on one or two lattice sides. So you can connect these type of features and these uh, things you see in these quantum Hall systems to kind of global so-called topological quantities of the systems. So here, just to, to say, so that for the whole talk, I will actually uh, if I talk about topological systems I actually mean by this simply 2D systems in magnetic field. And because we had this, this uh, question before, actually what's uh, relevant for the physics I, I will talk about is maybe not so much the topology here, but really the fact that we have magnetic fields. Okay, so magnetic fields, I mean, usually are discussed in solid state systems. Okay, and why is this the case? Because simply, uh, magnetic fields coupled to charges. And usually we have only electrons that we can kind of uh, reasonable control, while in kind of, you know, quantum optics system, we're dealing with neutral atoms, photons, and so on. So, but the thing which probably is well, well known here is that during the last maybe 20 years, 25 years, people have thought about how to bring this physics of magnetic fields also in the quantum optics world. And the idea is now, of course, not to directly couple fields to charges, but kind of rather mimic the effect of magnetic fields. And the very basic idea, which I, probably most of you know, is so if, suppose I have some arbitrary particle, you know, it can be a photon, it can be an atom hopping in a lattice. The actual effect of the magnetic field is that it prints phases on these hopping rates. Okay, so you cannot choose these hopping amplitudes real anymore. You have some phases, and these phases add up in a way, or let's say if you design this, if you design these phases in this way, you can actually mimic the effect of a magnetic field. Okay, so there is no real magnetic field presence. So that's why we speak of artificial or synthetic magnetic fields. But the particle moving this lattice, if you impose from outside somehow these phases, when it pops from one side to the other, and you arrange these phases in this particular pattern, which is just a pile sub substitution, then the system behaves, or the particle in this lattice behaves as there would be an effective field here in set direction with an amplitude. Beam. Okay, and yeah, so, and, and this, of course, I mean, gives also a lot of new possibilities, okay? It's not just that we mimic the magnetic field, we, we mimic the electronic system, but you also have new possibilities. And one, one thing is, of course, uh, because we, we design these magnetic fields, you know, it's, it's relatively easy, uh, at least in, in, in theory, to get arbitrary high field strength, okay? We don't need to put a big magnet there in the lab. We can just tune some laser phases, and suddenly we have a field strength which is impossible to obtain otherwise in electronic systems. 
Also, what you see in this, this picture here, you might have seen the side resolution. Okay, we, we cannot watch electrons moving through a lattice in, in a solid, that's just not possible. But here we can, you know, we have big systems, so we can watch these excitations propagate in the system. Another dif difference, um, which we've heard already a little bit, uh, was that we not, don't have fermions, but now bosons. Okay, this changes quite a bit of uh, the physics we're interested in. But in particular, it gives new opportunities. Okay, we can study something like condensation or lasing type phenomena that are not possible in a solid state system. But one final point that I want to, want to point out here in particular is that since we have now, for example, magnetic photons, these systems can also couple to other quantum systems. Okay, and that's another big difference to electrons, which essentially they impact a little bit among themselves. But here we really have control over, let's say, single photons. And they can then interact with other quantum systems that we have control over. And this type of interaction, okay, so this is really what I want to focus now in this talk and think about, okay, so what actually happens if we have some two level emitters, atoms, quantum dots, superconducting qubits, and now couple them to magnetic systems. Okay, so do the same type of quantum optics we do usually in free space or maybe in waveguides, but now with, with photons that feel magnetic field. Okay, and that's kind of the, the general question I want to, want to understand here and discuss now a little bit in more detail in the following talk. Okay, um, as a starting point, okay, let's, let's recapture a little bit um, uh, what we know about systems, uh, 2D, 3D systems uh, without magnetic field. Okay, so let's put a, uh, think about one of these systems that Alexandra talked about, put an emitter in such a, let's say two-dimensional lattice, make a big lattice out of it, put it in an excited state. And the thing that what uh, most likely happens is that this emitter you know, couples the photons, the photons propagate away. And if the system is big enough, we simply have a Markovian decay of our excited atom. And this type of uh, decay process can be understood. You know, it can actually uh, connect this decay rate to the density of states, local density of states, which for a 2D system would be uh, just given here. And uh, the thing that, okay, I just, just said here, that you have this Markovian decay, is pretty much true almost everywhere, except if you deliberately go to some special uh, cases, you know, for example, if you sit near the band edge, or if you go to one of these divergence, uh, divergences that uh, Alexandra also kind of uh, had in his talk, okay, so if you sit here, then something happens. But for most points, you know, for most general uh, situations that you, that you think about, of, this will simply lead to a kind of Markovian type of decay. Good. Um, then the question is, what happens if I now switch on a magnetic field? And the first thing that um, uh, I think Francesco mentioned in a little more detail is that we have these type of edge states. Okay, so we can put now an emitter not on, only in the center but also in the edge, and this emits a photon, but the photon cannot just propagate away, but it's confined here to the to the edges. And this, this type of physics is, of course, what when you usually think about topological photonics and so on, I mean, uh, a lot of the interest is really kind of to connect these edges, to look at these edge modes, connect them to something, to, to churn numbers in, in the system and, and, yeah, and, and study all these this type of, uh, of features here. And maybe from a pra practical point of view, this is also interesting because you see that the photon here, I mean, it stays along the edge, but also that goes only one way. Okay, so if you emit the excitation here, some quantum state or so, it goes in one direction and will for sure hit the next, next atom along the line. Okay, so this is actually very interesting uh, with res in respect to uh, designing robust uh, channels for quantum transport. Okay, so, so really to, to, if you want to route quantum uh, information in your system, it only goes one way and it is also immune to disorder. So this is a very interesting idea. And um, yeah, so we, of course, we are not the first one to think about these, these things. And here are just um, two examples. So one experiment, which by this type of physics uh, is kind of working already, okay? But people have managed to see this, this uh, color uh, transport and along the edges. And maybe here some, some work where I was also involved, uh, which is maybe a little bit more in the future, but which shows that this you can not only do for photons, but in principle also for phonons and couple some defect centers by a strain to the phonons and have then some chiral transport even around edges. Um, and this is kind of some, uh, some scheme, I and mean, it looks a little complex here, but it's some, some scheme um, that is essentially based on some earlier work by Vittorio and, and Florian Marquardt on how to 
design these magnetic fields also in uh, acoustic and optomechanical type of systems. Okay, so this is a, a very nice, uh, nice type of uh, direction where we can go. But actually for the current talk, I would just want to say, okay, so what we have here, that's chiral decay, okay? But I mean, this in principle can, is, is interesting, but it's still decay. Okay, so we have excited emitter and it emits its excitation and loses its excitation in one direction, but it's still kind of this type of physics um, that in principle is not unique to magnetic systems and can realize similar type of things also otherwise. Okay, so let me now go, okay, uh, so here we have this situation where we cut to the edges, but what actually happens when emitter now in the bulk? And now I think about you know, what we know about magnetic systems. If I have an emitter here, it will start to emit the photon in some random direction. But the photons, as I said before, in, in the system behave like, uh, like charged particles in the magnetic field. And a charged particle in a magnetic field, it will make some cyclotron orbit and actually come back to the, to the atom. If you emit it in, in another direction, it will make a cyclotron orbit and come back to the atom. And this does not only happen for this atom, okay, you place your atom somewhere else in, in the bulk, this also happens, and, and you see that, you know, wherever an, an atom is away from the edges, it cannot really get rid of the photon, okay, the photon is kind of confined by the Lorentz force, and in one way to think about the system is that every atom carries along its own cavity, okay, it's not somehow defined by, by the material or, or some boundaries or so, but simply because we have these, these magnetic fields, the photons are, are, are confined. And this now, of course, has a very, a really a drastic change. Okay, It's not just like in, here on the edge where you have going from, from bi-directional emission to one-directional emission, but here we really have, uh, have suddenly photons do not propagate away. And this means that the, the light matter interaction that, we use, that I said before is usually Markovian in most settings, now becomes intrinsically non-Markovian. And as you see, this, this mechanism here, I mean, didn't rely on any specific frequency or any coupling strength, okay? So we expect that really in these magnetic systems, all we know about regular quantum optics, we have to forget, forget because the dynamics uh, will be non-Markovian and, and, and uh, non-trivial at all coupling strength and at all frequencies, okay? Without re requiring any uh, special condition here. Okay, so this was a little bit the, the, the basic motivation and was basic idea. So let me just now uh, introduce a little bit of, of notation here. And, uh, but I think most of you are familiar with this. So what I really thinking about here is now some photonic lattice Hamiltonian, 2D lattice Hamiltonian. As I said before, we have some nearest neighbor hopping, hopping terms, which where we want to impose a phase, this e to the i phi. So if a, a photon hops from one side to the other, it will acquire this, this phase phi. And we will engineer these phases, this phi, uh, phi ij, uh, according to this rule, okay, where we impose that this um, vector potential here is nothing else but a constant, uh, is the vector potential of a constant field that is pointing out of the plane, so along, along the set direction. And now if you have such a setting, okay, there are essentially a few parameters that are relevant. So first of all, you can now take this, uh, essentially this magnetic flux through a single plaquette and divide it by the flux quantum, that's essentially h bar over e, and then you get a normalized field strength that is called alpha, I think typical in the literature. So this is a, a measure for the strength of the magnetic field. Then of course, you can also define a length. Okay, so there's a, a, of course a lattice uh, distance here, this, which is L zero, and the associated magnetic length that corresponds approximately to the cyclotron orbit will be given by L zero over the square root of this alpha. And finally, there's also frequency, and that's nothing else but the cy cyclotron frequency here, which is essentially given by the bandwidth that, that we have here times, times alpha. Okay, so these are the typical parameters that we need in the following. Um, just a little bit uh, about, uh, I think you don't want to talk here about implementation, so you know, we have heard a lot, a lot of talks and we hear a few more. So this type of physics, I mean, it's of course not trivial, but it, uh, at least by now there are several type of at least ideas or first experiments that demonstrate that they can do this really with optical photons, microwave photons, optomechanics, and a lot more. Okay, um, so if you think about these photonic lattices, I mean, what uh, then usually, or if you have such a Hamiltonian, you know, what people then often do is they calculate the spectrum or the, the, the eigenvalues as a function of this parameter alpha here. And what we get out of this, this is then usually called this uh, Hofstetter butterfly. 
is actually a quite complex structure, energy level structure. Okay, there are all these these fractals and so on, and it really looks uh, quite messy. So if you think about uh, making now a theory about light matter interaction for such a system, uh, yeah, maybe you get once you see the spectrum here, you might get okay. Let's let's go to another type of system. But the reason why this is scary is, is because it's you know it's deliberately plotted in a way where it looks it looks very fancy, it looks very very uh, very scary, very complex. Um, in the following, we can maybe take this 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 uh, butterfly. Okay, so what I want to do now is I cut it in half, and I also will just stre stretch this this thing a little bit just to understand better what's going on. And in this case, now as a function of alpha, we have kind of uh, uh, three regimes. Okay, so there is. It's kind of um, so. First of all, for very small magnetic fields, okay, the, the system will not feel the magnetic field. Or let's say the magnetic length will be larger than the lattice size, and that's why we, we don't have closed orbits, okay. So then, essentially, here we have, just have the density of states, uh, the eigenvalues of a regular lattice. Okay, nothing happens here. On the very uh, large alpha side, we have this this complex Hochstetter oh, butterfly, okay, and here also really this magnetic length. Is on the order of the lattice side, you, you have to worry about the lattice structure, okay, that we have a discrete lattice. But then there's also this regime in the middle. And here we have uh, the situation where this, uh, this cyclotron orbit is larger than the lattice sides, okay, so we don't uh, feel the individual sides anymore, but still much smaller than, than the, the, the system sides, okay. And this is actually the thing that I'm interested in. So here in this regime, uh, we really uh, can, can think about now a continuum theory of these magnetic photons. And you also see that here, actually, the, the structure, the energy level structure is already quite, quite, uh, quite regular, OK? So we just have only these, this discrete set of Landau, Landau levels, but not too, uh, nothing of this, this mess over here. OK, so and in this regime that I'm, I focus on uh, for the rest of the talk, OK, so we have these uh, uh, photonic lattices. And um, yeah, let me just summarize so we can diagonalize this Hamiltonian. And essentially find the eigenfunctions of the system. And these eigenfunctions are now nothing else but the lambda orbitals. Okay, so these are, I mean, look a little bit complicated, but these are nothing else but the usual lambda or orbitals in a continuum uh, because we're looking at these uh, intermediate moderate magnetic fields. Good. Um, yeah, so now we want to couple atoms to these lambda orbitals. And let me start with the simplest case of a single emitter. Okay, so I put now a single emitter in the bulk of this lattice. And as a first step, okay, just for consistency, uh, put the p field equal to zero and watch the evolution of the excited emitter. And here we just see a regular decay as expected. So now what happens if we switch on the magnetic field? Okay, and for the same situation I had over here, essentially nothing happens. Okay, so completely this the emitter stays completely excited. Okay, so this may be too boring. Let's let's try another frequency. Okay, let's try again and choose a different frequency. And now I see, okay, the emitter does something, but instead of decaying, it starts to just coherently oscillate forever. So how can we understand it? And that's actually, okay, so for this, let's go back to the spectrum of, of this, uh, this lattice. So for P equals zero, we plot the eigenvalues, they're just a straight line, which essentially means the density of states approximately constant. So we put the emitter frequency somewhere here, and then we have this situation, this Markov decay situation I, I had before, okay? So this is just a regular lattice. But now if I go to the uh, case of magnetic fields, okay, so my spectrum looks like this. I have these plateaus, so the lambda levels, and some, uh, some regions in between. And now, of course, you might, um, might ask, okay, so here, this is the situation. So I hit the same as, as here, I hit some states. So why does the emitter not decay? And the reason is now, okay, so here's just the energies, okay? But uh, if you now think a little bit more about these states, what these states represent, they represent the edge modes, okay? So the, the channels of edge modes. But if an emitter is in the middle, it simply doesn't feel them, okay? So it doesn't see any density, density of states here. So that's why there's no kind of mode to couple to and the emitter remains in the excited state. So, and what happens now here? So here I've changed the frequency and, and moved into one of these standard levels. And then suddenly I see not the smooth density of states, but something uh, a delta function like. Okay, and if you couple essentially to a single state, so that's why you have then these Rabi oscillation type physics. Okay, so in, in kind of summary, so, so now we have really kind of this, this very special situation. Okay, so either nothing happens or you go to the other extreme where you have these really nice Rabi oscillations whenever you get the emitter frequency hits one of these lambda levels. And you can also now. Um, 
be a little bit more precise and so okay that's the emitter dynamics but what happens okay so here the emitter has given up his excitation what happens to this excitation and now we plot the photonic densities and we really see you know what we get out is really just these nice uh, lambda orbitals that would you know correspond to these uh, symmetric lambda orbitals that I've shown before and we can also so similar to the things that uh, Francesco talked about we can also calculate, for example, the, the, the current profile now of the systems. And we really see that here we have the oscillate, the, even though we create a photon, which is not just there, but it also just uh, circulates around and then it's reabsorbed by the atom and so on. Maybe one uh, interesting point here is okay, because we have now these analytic solutions in, in this model coupling machine, we can also calculate the Rabi frequency. And actually, it turns out, which is maybe a little bit surprising. That this Rabi frequency, so it's given by this coupling strength, square of alpha times g, is actually independent of the lambda index. Okay, so somehow you might think okay, here the photon is quite extended, so the coupling must be weaker. Uh, but it actually turns out that if you go back to the lambda orbitals, so they are all normalized such they have uh, their normalized unity at the point of the atom. Okay, so they all couple the same strength. It's only then the field distribution that that is a little bit uh, distributed differently. That's why. For all these levels, you actually have the same type of lambda uh, uh, Rabi frequency. Okay, and this whole thing now is, is okay, here we looked at the dynamics, but of course, once you have Rabi oscillations, you can also look at a static picture. And what actually happens is now really that you hybridize your atom with one of these lambda photons. And that's why we call now this new type of uh, excitation that, that's uh, created here, also a lambda photon polarity. Good. Um, let me uh, maybe just one uh, one remark here. Um, so in principle, these lambda bases that I showed you before, okay, these basis states. So please keep. Uh, so these are defined with respect to some origin. Okay, so I define an origin, and then there's this variable uh, x plus i, which is defined with respect to zero here, and this defines now my lambda bases. So there's a certain gauge degree of freedom because I fix an origin in my in my otherwise extended lattice system. So now what actually happens, oh, but if an atom sits over here, you now we don't couple to one of these lambda orbitals, but to some wave function that is centered around the atom. And this has, okay, uh, has to do with the fact that, you know, if, if you now go back to the theory, you actually what we create, I mean, it's not, we don't couple to one of these lambda basis states, but actually the photon wave function that, that appears here is determined by the photon screen function which is you know, a quantity which measures if, you're, if, you know, if I shake my system here uh, at R, Rj, what is the probability to find a photon at R, Ry? And maybe to speed up a little bit, so in, in the end of the day, we can simplify the system screen function, and we really see that kind of the, this only now depends on the difference between the emitter and then the photon. And um, yeah, it has in, in overall then a really nice structure that is something that is completely gauge independent, uh, except some phase factor over here uh, that still depends on the origin, but that doesn't play a role once you uh, talk about single atoms. Okay, so this is a little bit the type of uh, uh, physics, uh, so how we can think about the system in the case of a single emitter coupled now to a single photon. Okay, so it's, it's, uh, it's very nice and, and we pretty much understand everything there. So let's think now about many, uh, many polaritons, many atoms. Okay, so in this case, we have, for example, here an emitter, it creates this photon. And that's it. Okay, and what I mean by this, uh, by this is that this photon doesn't evolve. Okay, it, ha it has no dispersion. So in a regular uh, for, uh, system, you would create a photon, the photon will propagate away. But because we have these flat, flat lambda levels, this is the only thing you can do. You can create this photon and go back to the emitter. If you now put a second system there, we have the same situation here. The emitter puts a photon now localized around this situation. Photon doesn't propagate, goes back. So this kind of indicates that this system actually is, is rather simple, okay? We have a two-dimensional lattice, but the only degrees of freedom here in the simple setup are these two photons and these two atoms over here. So you can indeed then, then show that this is, uh, this is the case also for, for many atoms, okay? So if you have now n atoms in the system, the relevant degrees of freedom are these n two levels emitters and n lambda or orbitals. Okay, so the whole dimension of the system is considerably smaller than actually the system we started off with all these, these uh, hundreds and thousands of lattice sites. 
So this is uh, just a, a small remark here. I mean, this is um, true uh, to first approximation. If you now look at closer and especially look at systems where these, these atoms are closer together, these lambda orbitals, I mean, they don't form a, a, a orthonormal set. Okay, so these, these operators I introduced before, they wouldn't commute. So that's a little bit uh, bad if you want to do a consistent theory out of it. But then you can kind of solve it by essentially taking these this orbitals and building a new orthonormal basis out of it. And this is this matrix K here, which probably I will not go into further details here. Okay, but putting every, everything together, then this, uh, so what you can now have in the system, and, and I think that's really very special about this type of uh, magnetic systems, you can now couple, so here we have N atoms coupled to N, N, N photons, so these are these lambda uh, photons, these operators that generate these wave packets, and then you have the almost usual James Cummings type interactions, you, you excite an atom, you destroy a photon, except that due to the fact that we have this normalization, we have imposed this normalization condition, you convert the local interaction into something that is non-local and in hidden in here in this K and M matrix elements, okay? But this you can still evaluate very easily on a computer. Good, um, so let me uh, maybe show um, uh, a few examples of what, what do we get now out of this, 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 this picture now from, from multiple excitations. And here is now a first non-trivial example where we have maybe, so we have still a single excitation system, but three atoms. And this is kind of the type of spectra that you get. And you see now in this parallel spectrum, okay, you get the total now is this, uh, six lines. And just the, the, what are the main features? Okay, so first of all, we have this, this Rabi splitting, which you already had from a single a photon, uh, which just gives this, this spacing here. At, at, if they are very far apart, okay, everything is then independent. But then you see, if you now bring the atom closer together, they are uh, this polariton, they have a photon wave, wave function component, and this photon wave function component will start to overlap, okay? And this will be this exponential shape, and then there are these Laguerre polynomials from the lambda orbitals, okay? So this already gives some non-trivial overlap dependence of these wave functions. But this is not, not all, okay? This, is, uh, this also exists in many other systems, but then we still have to keep in mind we have a magnetic field uh, switched on. Okay, so that's that's why these magnetic these these photons are not just stationary; these are circulating. So that's why also these uh, magnetic properties show show up in, the, in these lambda polaritons. And now you can see that this actually this the, the quantity that appears here is a sum of these phase angles that appear in the screen's function. But if you uh, work it out in detail, you find that it only depends on the area, so something which is gauge independent. Okay, so you can shift this around in the plane. It will only depend on the enclosed area. So everything, all the predictions are again gauge independent. Um, so now, if you take these three atoms and you go to the whole lattice of atoms, okay, the, the things can then be quite complex. I mean, you can still easily calculate now the spectra, but you already see that, you know, something like here, 16 atoms in this lattice as a function of this lattice spacing. You have now all these magnetic effects. You have this wave function overlap, uh, overlap this like air polynomials and so on. And it can, uh, so these type of things can be really complicated. And uh, here, you know, I mean, you have some, also this, this type of fractal stru structure that you kind of uh, remember from the Hofstetter butterfly, but because it's a little bit, uh, that is distorted butterflies, it's maybe better to call this here a Hochstetter caterpillar, something like this. But you see that, that all these, these magnetic features, you know, they directly translate into our light matter interaction, into our polarion physics here. Good. Um, so if I have just maybe five minutes, uh, five minutes or a few minutes. A couple of more minutes. So what was it? Uh, so you, you are already run out of, of time. Okay. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, so let me then just uh, briefly mention, okay, so uh, so far, uh, okay, the last slides, I, I just talked about single uh, atom physics, but now with this type of models that we have, the simplified picture, we can also understand two or maybe then also higher, higher photon numbers. And this is now just an, uh, a feature of this uh, two photon spectrum. And again, I mean, for very far distances, we have essentially atoms coupled with photons, they don't interact with themselves. So you can understand these features now as a combination of independent James Cummings letters. And one, part, one feature of this James Cummings letter is of course that you have a sort of interaction induced when two photons sit on the same, same atom. 
And this is what you also can see now, if you look a little bit close at these wave functions, okay, you can uh, think about now this, uh, the system about, so let's look at something like photon photon correlations. Okay, so what happens, uh, what is the probability if I detect one photon sitting on this atom, what is the probability to find a second uh, photon somewhere else? And in this state over here, we have uh, photons distributed across the system. Okay, so if I find a photon here, the other one sits at one of the other atoms. But if I go to this interacting state, if I find a photon in this atom, also the second photon sits on top of this atom. Okay, and that's why they're interacting and have this energy offset U. And okay, so here we understand everything, but then you can also go now uh, deeper in, in, into this uh, intermediate phase here. So now you see, uh, again, if you find a photon here, the, the, the other photon sits, sits away, uh, is localized away. And then if you think about this type of state, so they're really some sort of, uh, in our Laughlin type uh, state where with the photons that circulate here want to avoid each other. Okay, so this is a precursor and, yeah, and then you can also go closer. So here, uh, eventually the, the atom, the photon starts to overlap and all the, so all the atoms only see one, one, uh, one uh, photon physics. Uh, and in this regime, we then discover the usual James, James Cummings physics. Okay, so you go from KVD, QED, uh, usual KVD is something messy between to back to Davis Cummings physics. Good, um, yeah, because I'm running out of time. I mean, just the last point is, is about, okay, you can also uh, go to off resonant thing and, and get effective spin-spin models. But I think in the interest of time, and uh, I will just skip this and come to my summary conclusion. So I told you a little bit about the, the physics of these magnetic systems where you have this, appear, uh, this occurrence now, uh, emergence of lambda photon paradigms, which are now kind of a type of new atom photon bound state with these chiral lambda photons around. Uh, I think the interesting part is really that you have already some quite uh, complex effects, but at the same time, uh, a lot of the features, we still have uh, analytic uh, predictions and also numerically, a lot of these even higher photon number physics can be still be done numerically. And I think this makes it very attractive uh, to study now really nonlinear behavior. And uh, this could be really interesting then for quantum simulation applications where we have both KVD QED quantum optic physics on one side, but also the physics of strongly interacting magnetic systems that here are show up always kind of together. Okay, so with this, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Peter. Uh, it was very interesting. So we have a couple of questions. Uh, I think Lavi Ukreti can start. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for this wonderful talk. I just had a couple of questions. The first was uh, where you showed this uh, Hofstadter butterfly. So maybe I missed it. Uh, how were you changing the, the flux parameter which was threading inside the placket? So yeah. uh, that's... Okay, so, uh, 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 let me just correct a little bit. Yeah. So yeah, so the parameter I just changing here is this alpha. And alpha is the yeah. flux through one black plaquette. Yeah. Because I remember that you were showing these uh, two level meters, and then I could see that uh, they, the, the, the photon was propagating in one direction, but then I missed how you were able to change this alpha parameter in experiment. How could you get- uh, Okay, so as an experiment, so I, I consider this type of model. Uh, in this model, I have, okay, once more, I, I choose the, the phase pattern. So that's I do in experiments. And if you now want to uh, look at details, so it depends now on the experiments, how you change it. But uh, often you impose, for example, you have a nonlinear mechanism and you impose, so this would be driven by a laser. And then this phi would just be given by the laser phase. Okay. And, and then you can change this arbitrary, but, but maybe um, here, you know, I mean, one has to look now at, at the very specific details of these implementations. Uh, but in, in principle, people know how to implement this and tune this to any value. Okay, okay. So one quick, uh, one last question is, uh, so when you showed the plot of this Hofstadter butterfly, so somehow the fractal structure was, let's say, not resolved. So are there any degrees of uh, freedom in the system which can be controlled to get a fractal structure? Like, uh, do we have such kind of control over the those degrees of freedom that if you could have, I don't know, 
those kind of uh, control, maybe fractal structure could be resolved. So I was just wondering. Yeah, I mean, let's say you can also here you see it. I mean, this is um, now a density of state where kind of each level is, is a little bit smeared out what you would also get in experiment if you have decay. But in principle, the decay can be arbitrarily small and you can go back to these, uh, I mean, there's no fundamental limit to go back to these fracture structures. It's just at this stage, you know, if, if you're sitting here, uh, I wouldn't know okay. what the atom couples to this part do, is doing, you know, because it's just, you have some resonant, one resonant level, a few of them are off resonant. So it will sim simply be a quite a messy dynamics. And, and the thing what we understand is here, when we have these straight lines, these lambda levels, but in principle, yeah. you can also sit in here. It's just that I don't know really what's going on. Okay, so probably it's just a, a big mess that you get here. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. But nothing forbids you to, to do this. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think there's time for one more question. So Maxine Jamot, uh, you can unmute yourself now. Unmute. You can uh, you hear me? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Okay, right. Hello, everybody. Uh, so my question was, um, uh, would it be possible uh, through the emitter to get a photon-photon interaction and maybe simulate uh, something like fractional quantum Hall effect if you have photon-photon interactions? I don't know if yeah. you So this was, okay, that was a little bit uh, too fast here. So this, this was a little bit this idea about these two photon states I, I told you. So this would be a, a precursor of what, what, what this, or, some form of what you say, okay? So by simply having two photons on one atom, the energy of this two photon state is, is a little bit higher than the one of two photons is, that are distributed on two different atoms. Mm -hmm. And this is what, what you see here. So, so this state, this contains two photons on one atom. So you yes. detect one photon, the other photon will also sit around this atom. So that's why you have this higher energy here. Yes. And if you now think about, so these are now two photons, but you see that the ground state already in this manifold is the one photon, is this state, where the second photon is, is away. And this was a little bit this uh, type of uh, comment I yes. made here with the laughing yeah, okay. types. I mean, it's All right. a little bit different. Okay. In principle, you have photons avoid each other. And if you now plot the chiral flow, you know, you would also have some circulating currents around. So that's why, I mean, still in quotation marks here. But this is the uh, a little bit the type of physics you see already for two photons, and which we also want to study now for, for more photons or so. But there is nothing nothing there yet. Yeah. And is it possible to try to uh, see how the con conductivity evolves, uh, function of the the magnetic flu flux or something? Um, maybe to, so, to appreciate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Uh, I mean, conductivity that's a little bit uh, different because now you have to. So this is are now two photons or or yeah two. Polaridon sitting somewhere in the bulk. Mm -hmm. I think now you have to start thinking about how you connect it, what type of connectivity. Yes. So I, I think these electronic measures like, like current are maybe not the most appropriate things uh, to study in this in this quantum optical system. So I think there are better measures and and maybe people actually know, know about this case okay, so there are a lot of experts here. So All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so thank you everyone for attending this session. Thank you also to the speakers. And uh, I'll see you later after the coffee break. Thank you, Peter. Okay, thanks. And applause for everyone, for all the speakers. Bye. So the stage is yours. Thank you uh, very much, Daniel. Um, yeah, and I also want to start with thanking my co-organizers for letting me speak. <laughs> and uh, I also want to thank the Benes Center for organizing uh, this workshop and helping us organizing it. That's really great. So yeah, now we're going to switch gears a little bit. So we're going to talk about non-reciprocity in engineered quantum systems. And this is also like a little bit of an, a start for this session because 
we will move away a little bit perhaps from the topologies unless the other speakers surprise me um, today. Um, and we're going to move um, towards few body systems and uh, non-reciprocity. And so I will like start as well then with um, first perhaps explaining how um, we think of non-reciprocity, perhaps more from a quantum information processing perspective. Um, and then I will talk about a little bit older work and how we can engineer non-reciprocity. And um, in the end, I'm going to give you some rather new results from, from my group in Berlin. But let's start with explaining my title. So that's how I always like to start. Um, so non-reciprocity in engineered quantum systems. So what I mean when I speak of engineered quantum systems are systems which are rather macroscopic, but still behave quantum mechanically. And the hope or idea is that we can use or harness this um, quantumness for applications, um, for technologies like computation, com uh, communication, and sensing. And here is just a, like a few examples you see on the slide, and um, there are a lot of other examples. So this uh, on the left, we have something which is clearly a, a candidate for a quantum computation platform. It's a chip from IBM. It's a four qubit chip made out of superconducting uh, material, a superconducting circuit. And um, in the middle, what we have here is also a device which lives in the microwave world, but a completely different kind of setup. So here we have an optomechanical system where we have an LC resonator, where we have a capacitor, and one of the plates of the capacitor is movable. And this is the mechanical degree of freedom. And it's a rather large uh, mechanical uh, um, mode or, or oscillator in the sense, but still they were able, like the NIST group here uh, from which this paper is take, uh, this picture is taken, and um, we're able to cool this mechanical mode into the quantum ground state. Similarly, in a different regime of like the world of photons is on the right, where we have a device from Oscar Painter's group, where we have an optomechanical crystal, and here the mechanical mode lives inside of this beam. The beam has holes punched into it, they vary in size, and so form a mechanical and an optical cavity. And this is clearly like operated with like real photons, as perhaps some of you will say, and they were also able to um, cool this mechanical mode into the quantum ground state in 2011. And as I don't want to waste too much time on uh, explaining more about engineering quantum systems, I'm going to right away to talk about non-reciprocity. Yeah? And so in a nutshell, what I mean with that is that we, and you will see how we can do this in a couple of minutes, that if we have a system or like two systems, quantum systems A and B, that they interact in a unidirectional manner. So that system A drives system B, but not a, the other way around. Yeah, I can also think of this like information transfer just goes from A to B. And this like unidirectional information transfer is really important, really crucial for quantum information processing. But let's start at the beginning, because in general, like reciprocity or the world is reciprocal. And um, in optics, we can think of reciprocity under the concept, like if I can see you, then I can see, you can see me. Yeah? So we have here a like, really simple example where we have a scientist and a lion and they're separated by a reciprocal medium. So the scientist can see the lion and the lion can see the scientist. Yeah? It's not a favorable situation taking it the lion. So if we now break the symmetry of reciprocity in this medium, so we have a non-reciprocal medium, we have a directional information transfer yeah? where, for example, the, uh, the scientists can still observe the line, but not the other way around. A yeah, much safer situation. Slightly more formal, we can think of this that the transmission amplitudes change under the exchange of source and detector. And if we want to model this really simply on the simplest level, then um, we can do this with a scattering approach and the non-reciprocity then is reflected in the asymmetry of the scattering matrix. And here we have the form which would describe really the perfect non-reciprocity where we have unidirectional transmission from the left to the right. And as I said, this is really important property to have unidirectional transmission if you think about quantum information processing. And this is, I think, one of the standard pictures people take in the community if we talk about why it's important. So what you see here is a is a uh, picture from the IBM press release um, of the 50 qubit chip. You don't see the chip at all. It's a, perhaps in here, perhaps not. 
but what I, the point what I want to make is that outside here, you see these boxes and these are all like boxes which uh, contain isolators or circulators or so unidirectional devices, which are crucial to uh, control the signal flow towards and away from the chip. And you can see you need a lot of them um, to operate such a chip. And sticking with this idea, so if you break it down, so if we want to have, if you have a quantum system, as for example, a cubit in a cavity, what we want to do is we want to read it out by protecting the source, for example, the qubit. Yeah, so we, we really require these non reciprocal devices to control the signal propagation. But as you also have seen in the picture, these uh, the standard devices come with a level of shortcomings. Yeah, so the, the, the standard devices are based on uh, the magneto-optical effect and they are rather bulky and cannot implement them on chip. They require rather large magnetic fields which is bad if you have like uh, you can like you can't have them on chip because you don't want a large magnetic field next to your qubit for example and they are also blocked by losses which is always bad and um, and you can also not directly um, enhance your signal right it's just root signals so people have started to think uh, about new strategies uh, how to engineer non reciprocal devices um, without using the magneto-optical effect yeah to so overcome all these aspects um, to don't use a magnetic field to be able to implement them on chip and so on. And I just give you some examples. I'm sure that I forgot some. So um, please, apolog I apologize already, but I will give you just some, some examples um, um, of the new design concepts people have developed in the last years. And here we have, for example, a superconducting circuit implementation where in the end, it's just based on coupled modes. Right, and this can be like we have three coupled modes. You modulate the coupling between the modes, and then if you do this in the right manner, so you will see you can um, uh, realize non-reciprocal transmission, and you can even amplify the signal if you choose the right kind of modulation. And this um, such a such a system has been realized by the Yale Group uh, in 2015, and also um, um, by the NIST Group in Boulder. Yeah, this is here, this is just in the end, this is a really similar kind of setup. It's three, three modes, three SC resonators, which are coupled via nonlinear element. In the case of the Yale group, it's a Josephson ring modulator. It's just a loop intersected with four Josephson junctions. And in the case of the NIST group, they had a squid. So you'll have only two Josephson junctions. Yeah, but the idea is the same. You have a nonlinear element and you couple your, your, your modes to it and then you modulate. Another community which has been super active in the in the last years to um, uh, like realize non reciprocity is the optomechanics community. Here, as I said, it's just a couple of examples. We will hear about uh, um, um, an example for an optomechanical system also in the following talk. And um, here, the system is in the end it has similar ingredients. Okay, so here, for example, we have a device from the NIST group in Builder, they had here not three modes, but four modes, so two mechanical modes, two optical modes. And by applying the right kind of modulation, you know, they, they were able to realize non-reciprocal um, signal transport. And this is uh, just recent examples or rather recent examples, but there has also been ideas, which I think started out by the work of um, Peter Abel and Mohamed Hafezi in 2012, where, um, they looked at like um, like also again a three mode system but slightly different. So for example, micro cavity, which is coupled to a, a transmission line or waveguide, and then again the interplay of these modes in the right manner will lead to non uh, non reciprocal transmission through this uh, waveguide, a transmission line, a fiber. I think it's in this case. Um, yeah, and so, but a lot of these examples involve parametric modulation of modes. So I, I want to just, in, if in case you're not um, so familiar with it, give you an idea about um, the basic concept of parametric modulation. Yeah? And this is, I think it's a really powerful concept um, to engineer interactions. And, um, and the basic ones are, for example, if I have two modes, and I modulate these two modes at the frequency difference. And the process I obtain then is that I have frequency conversion. It's a really uh, simple process where we have exchange between these two modes, just a hopping. And as we 
we modulate it, for example, from the outside, we can control the strength of this hopping and we can also imprint a phase on this process, which will become la uh, important later on. Similarly, we can also modulate at the, at the sum of the two frequencies. And then we obtain a process which is called parametric amplification or also two mode squeezing interaction. Here we simultaneously create two excitations in, in our modes. Yeah? And um, yeah, and again, we can control it really well because we have a knob on this J and also on this face. And you can also get more creative and apply multiple tones um, as they have done in these experiments in the left and right. And this is like the basic ingredients, um, which uh, already allowed for if you are able to design a device where you can parametrically uh, modulate modes to um, realize on chip implementations of non reciprocal devices, um, which are quantum limited. And you can also have, because you can have these parametric amplifier interactions, uh, also directional amplification. Uh, and um, the crucial ingredients for this non-reciprocity as we have identified is really that you're besides having this platform is that you have control over the phase the loop phase so to say the phase in your system yeah, and this is perhaps also clear for all of you because what you need for this is you need to uh, break time reverse symmetry and this is what the phase will give you but we have an open system so time reverse symmetry makes perhaps not as much sense um, 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 to to use a symmetry, so we speak of reciprocity, and because we have a dissipative system, and dissipation is also here really important to realize um, non-reciprocity. So let's start um, perhaps again, let's go a step back and think about how, how can we actually realize non-reciprocity by design. And this is something where we start out with this picture, similar to what you had before. So we have, an, if you have two systems, A and B, and then in general, these interactions between these systems is reciprocal, right? So uh, we have forward and backward processes and both systems influence each other. And the question is, how can we break the symmetry? And um, we have found one way of doing this, and, and this is rather also simple. It's just by balancing a coherent interaction with a corresponding dissipative interaction. Okay, so we couple our two systems A and B via a coherent like uh, uh, dynamics, and then we couple it indirectly or what we call an engineered reservoir. And the engineered reservoir is nothing else than an auxiliary system, which could perhaps be a mode or something else, which is strongly damped. And then we, we think of like this an engineered reservoir, which mediates a dissipative coupling between mode A and mode B or, or system A and system B. And to see how this works, it's best to go to the simplest uh, limit. And this is the Markovian limit where we can uh, adiabatically eliminate this engineered reservoir and um, describe the system by a Lindblad master equation. And this is the, the simple form here. We have our coherent coupling. I'm, I'm using here we general operators A and B. Okay, we, we are not restricted to this kind of linear quadratic interaction, but this is here just the form uh, I choose. So A could also be something else. Uh, um, and we combine this coherent coupling, which is associated with strength lambda, with what I said, this dissipative coupling. And this is a non-local su uh, super operator in a sense, because it contains A and B operators. And here we have this, this important phase file. Uh, and clearly, this is not important to have the phase here in this dissipator. We could also make a gauge transformation and put this into the coherent coupling. Important is just that we have one phase, uh, which is non zero, non vanishing. And then all we have to do is actually it's just balancing the strength lambda of the coherent coupling with the strength of the dissipated process. And then we have to set phi to the right value. And the sign of phi, if it's plus or minus pi over two, will then determine the direction of the interaction. And to see that this actually works. Yeah, so we, we will go for an example and later on as well. But here, just if we look at the dynamics of the expectation values for arbitrary system operators, and here I already applied the directionality conditions, we will see that we have a system A, which sees just some local effects, some dissipative effects, while system B has as well, but system B will get the information of system A. Yeah, so we have created a situation where we have a non-reciprocal interaction where system B is driven by system A, but not the other way around. 
Uh, and this clearly, if we would change the phase, we would have the reverse situation, but we have really now a knob between the interactions between the two systems, uh, which is pretty neat. And um, if you go back and think about the, some of the examples, which we saw before, based on this parametric modulation of coupled mode, we can actually take the recipe and apply it to it to understand why these system pairs work. And this is, for example, for the superconducting circuit realization, we can think of that we have three modes. One of them would, in our eyes, be this auxiliary mode, where we have like the direct coupling between mode one and mode two. And this third mode, yes, is a dissipative coupling and uh, an, an auxiliary uh, mode. And one can also model this completely differently. And Leo Zani in German Harder did this in a framework of a graph theory approach, which also nicely gives a recipe on how one can design non reciprocity between coupled modes. And similarly, we can also think about the optomechanical example where we now have four modes. Here, the story is a little bit more complicated, but in the end, if you uh, um, the, the mechanical modes here, C1, C2, and the cylindrical cavity modes, the mechanical modes mediate an effective, coherent, and dissipative interaction. And thus, if you bring it to the right value, can realize non reciprocity. And so, I that this is this were just examples and examples for few mode systems and this is this is really neat and we can use this to think about other designs for non-reciprocal devices because as i already said uh, it's actually more general so you can um, really not you don't only have to think about coupled modes it's really a purely general recipe to construct a directional interaction between two systems and we um we discussed how it works in the Markovian limit, but you really don't need the Markovian limit. You can also do this in a non-Markovian limit. And um, this was also shown um, in a collaboration with Oscar Painter groups and uh, KJ Fang was the experimentalist uh, on, on this project, um, where we have, again, this is this optomechanical cell. And here there were two of these optomechanical cells here. So this is a, the sketch in my, my how I see this device, you can look I don't know which one is easier for you to see, but in the end, we have two optomechanical cells. They have two tones. If you drive the optomechanical interaction, you will um, then realize non reciprocal transmission. And here you see some results from the experiment. So we have the transmission ratio as a function of frequency. And then if you approach the right loop phase or the right phase value, you, they were able to get actually up to 30 dB of isolation. Um, and here you deviate from this pi over two value because you are in some sense in the non Markovian regime where um, we have the condition slightly changes. But in the end, the, the principle is the same. It's the balancing of a coherent and dissipative interaction. And you also, you don't have to only to think about um, um, like few levels or few body systems. And this is the only many body system I'm going to show today. But this is if you actually bring this all uh, on the idea onto the lattice. And this was some work um, um, in collaboration with Parker and Tureci, um, where we thought about applying all this to non reciprocal root signals for an, a network of oscillator. And important is that here you see some examples how a signal could propagate through a square lattice. And you know, this is, looks like an edge. It's not an edge state, though, um, because we don't engineer any band structure. We really locally control the signal propagation. So we don't go only along the edge. We can go over two edges. We can go every way we want. And we don't have, it's an open system. We don't have to worry about this dissipation in distance. We have just to control the couplings between um, uh, individual nodes of our network. Um, I'm not saying that this is not challenging as well, but um, it's just it's a different kind of principle. And this is like, um, yeah, still also an interesting system by itself to think about the topology about the system. But what I'm going to talk about in my last five minutes is um, actually a new aspect, which um, I think is really interesting. Um, so far, we like all the signal propagation or the non-reciprocity cases, the examples we saw, this is in the end, there's nothing quantum about it, right? We, we model these systems and we put hats on it, and but we do this just to understand the noise properties at the end, right? So the non-reciprocity itself holds up to the, to, the, to the classical level. 
And so the questions, uh, uh, one question my group asked in Berlin is, so what about non-reciprocity in the quantum region? And the simplest this, uh, question you could start with is how is it about like with entanglement generation? Uh, can you generate uh, entanglement in non-reciprocal systems? And I'm going to focus now on a really specific example and where we actually see some interesting entanglement behavior. So, and this is like really specific. So we have um, like we combine two interactions who by themselves actually generate entanglement. So we have, this is two mode squeezing. We know that this creates steady state entanglement. And it's also the source for like creating entangled photon pairs in, in, in microwave devices. And um, we combine this with what we call like dissipative entanglement. Yeah, this was studied by Ying Dang Wang and Ash Clerk in 2013, where the entanglement between two modes is mediated via an auxiliary mode. Yeah? And we, we take this and combine these two and ask is if we now have a non reciprocal system where we have in some way a decoupling, yeah? we have a unidirectional interaction, um, does the steady state entanglement actually survive? Yeah. And um, so what we do, we, we take this master equation for this um, for these two modes. We have here um, this the dissipative uh, uh, coupling between the modes, and we couple this as well um, to the outside world via waveguides, external waveguides. And we have our two mode squeezing interaction. And to show you also again that this is actually like these two interactions are the right ones to realize non reciprocity. What thing we can do is actually look at the equations for the for the uh, operators of mode one and two. Yeah? And so these two interactions, what they give us is local effects. Right. So mode one will see some additional damping, while this mode two will see what you can call anti damping. Yeah? So and, and can lead to an enhancement. So this is by itself also a directional amplifier, just to say. And these two, um, um, like besides these local effects, you also have coupling between the modes. And you see you have part comes from the coherent coupling and part comes from the dissipative coupling. And important is here this phase, right? That you have here plus and here minus uh, e to the i phi. And um, e to the minus plus i phi, to be correct. And if we now apply the directionality condition in this form, for example, choose minus pi over two, we see that um, this mode one decouples from mode two while not the other way around. And choosing the condition the other way around, we would have the reverse situation. And so on the level of first moments, we see this decoupling. And then the question is, okay, how, how is this if we think about second moments, if we think about correlations in the system, do we actually also see this same kind of um, cancellation? And to do so, we, we clearly, the, the quantity to look at is the covariance matrix, which actually describes these correlation. And we, we go and work around a quadrature basis and characterize the state. And we assume that we have only a vacuum input for the moment. And then we can we see we can decompose our uh, uh, scatter uh, covariance matrix in a part which is independent of the face and has no cross covariances. So this is something where we um, definitely will not see any entanglement because we have no correlations. But the other part actually has a really interesting structure because here, like I already said like phi to be plus or minus pi over two. So the sign is now determining if we go to the left or to the right. Um, we see here that the cross covariances, which I here we have some, this is good, but they vanish if the phase is minus pi over two. So there we have again this cancellation as we have for the first moments, but they don't cancel for the other direction for pi over two uh, um, plus pi over two where we have actually a maximum of, um, of correlations between the two modes. And um, if this also leads to entanglement, we have to, that's not enough to look at the covariance matrix. Clearly we have to choose a measure of entanglement and we go with the, um, the logarithmic negativity here to characterize this entanglement. And exactly what we saw from the covariance matrix stays true also for the entanglement. So if we are at the phase pi over two, we have a maximum of entanglement between mode one and two. So we, we go in the reverse direction, things like that. And if you are going to minus pi over two, your entanglement is completely vanishing. 
So you have somehow a switch of entanglement depending on which direction you go or which phase you have, which uh, is a really intriguing uh, feature. Um, um, but yeah, that the phase is in the end determining if you're entangled or not. And this, um, clearly I'm happy to talk more about this. Um, for now, um, I just want to show, tell you that this is also seems to work. So there is some experimental collaboration with um, Chris Wilson's group and um, here Sam Bochan was the postdoc doing the, uh, or the graduate student now postdoc uh, doing the experiment. And here, there's just some preliminary data where you see the, the correlations in the systems as a function of the, uh, the phase. And, um, and you see that here, if you go in this direction from the left to the right, it's exactly that the, very, uh, the correlations between one and two vanishes while they are maximum in, in, in the case if you go in the reverse direction. And clearly there is something going on also with the correlations between a third mode, the auxiliary mode, but this, this some more details I can, I can talk to if you have questions. But with this, I, um, the time is also over. Um, I want to just acknowledge the funding we have and also our collaborators, which uh, um, worked on us on all these projects. So clearly I, I did work a lot of Ash on these non-reciprocity aspects. The latest things um, I, I worked together with Hakan. Said was involved in the entanglement project and the experimental list for the optomechanics and non-reciprocity experiments were um, uh, Oscar Painter um, at Caltech and Kiji Fang, who is now uh, going to talk later. I'm looking really forward to his talk and the recent results from Waterloo. And last but not least, I want to also like thank my group in, in Berlin and you for your attention. Cool. Uh, thank you a lot, uh, Anya, for this, for this very nice introductory talk and these amazing results that you showed at the end. Um, we now have a few minutes uh, for questions. So Ariana asked one in the chat. Um, um, I'm not sure, can I can I unmute? I can't unmute you. I think I can ask you to unmute you. So you can ask now if you want. Otherwise, I'll ask the question for you. Okay. Well, I'll ask. Um, her question was: What is the difference between non-reciprocity and chirality? <laughs> it's a good question. So I, I try like this is like I'm I would this is a this is a good question and I'm not sure if I can fully answer. I'm trying to avoid to use the word chiral because it's it's used in so many combinations. Um, and non-reciprocity is clearly the thing we, we talk about um, because you can have chiral molecules, you can have, you know, chiral things go, like things be chiral if they have a direction, like atoms, for example, chiral quantum objects which emit in one direction, but this is not the same as like non-reciprocity uh, in the sense, or like this, this where you have unidirectional transformation transfer, like an asymmetric scattering matrix. And so, um, Chirality does not automatically come with an asymmetric uh, 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 scattering matrix. But uh, clearly, a chiral waveguide can also be a non reciprocal waveguide. So these words can go together, but I'm trying to stick to one. Very good. Federico, can you speak, or is it not possible for you? I think uh, we uh, have uh, to unmute him. Daniel, if you want, I can, I can try to do it. Uh, sure. Yes. Uh, can you hear okay. me? Oh, okay. yeah, perfect. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. I wanted to ask you whether um, is it important that your coupling, your coherent coupling, is given by a parametric driving instead of a beam split Hamiltonian, or it's just a or it's just a collective jump operator that gives you these non-reciprocal couplings. No, you. So the you don't need the parametric aspect. You should, if you have like if you have any kind of Hamiltonian, you can then just use the recipe and design how theoretically a dissipator could look like. The question is, can you realize it or not? And parametric couplings is just the one way to go to do this with with, with coupled nodes. But you can also um, like if you have just hopping between modes, static hopping, then you will have um, issues on control mapping these directionality conditions. So you have to be able to, to have some control knob. You can have one of these couplings to be passive, 
but you need okay. you need some control knob and parametric is just for these couple mode system a good way to go but it's not the recipe itself is not limited to that at all okay thank you great thank you i would suggest uh, anya you um reply to the other questions there were a few more in the chat mm -hmm. and we will move on to the next uh, speaker so please unshare yes, so okay. that laura can can share and after this introduction by Anja Mittermann, we'll, we'll move on to Laure Mercier de Lepinet, sorry for my French, who is an experimentalist and a postdoctoral researcher at Aalto University, working with Mika Silampe. And she's going to talk about optomechanical non-reciprocal refrigerator near the quantum limit. Um, uh, yeah, uh, the state is yours, Laure. Um, we can see your pointer and your presentation okay. is not, yeah, now it's, yeah, perfect. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, my camera is unfortunately broken, okay. so uh, yeah, I don't have a face, but I can see you, so my computer is non-reciprocal somehow. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> Very cool. So, yeah. Thank you for uh, attending my talk on uh, non-reciprocal optomechanics, and thank you for organizing this uh, meeting. Um, so I, I, will, I, I will talk about precisely one of the systems Anya presented, um, an optomechanical system that was initially uh, built using uh, the same experimental platform as was used uh, to implement uh, microwave and optical isolators and directional amplifiers. Uh, so as Anya uh, introduced to, to, to to, to get the uh, uh, directional transport of energy, uh, one solution is to store this energy in a resonant mode, for example, a cavity mode. And then if this cavity mode is coupled to another cavity mode, then the energy is able to, to leak through and then it can be retrieved on the other side. And what she uh, was saying is that uh, if you have a pair of these couplings instead of one coupling only, uh, then the pair of couplings interfere and there's a trick to make them interfere differently uh, for the coupling from cavity one to cavity two and the coupling from cavity two to cavity one. So um, this trick relies, as, as she was uh, saying, on the uh, presence of a, a dissipative part in this, in this coupling. Um, and the, the, there, there were several implementations of this uh, uh, idea. Uh, so she presented ac actually this one, uh, where one of the coupling was direct and the other was through one or two mechanical modes between cavities. And but, uh, today I will, uh, I will uh, focus on a system that is a, a bit more like this one. Uh, which already was implemented uh, several times, where cavities are coupled through mechanical oscillators using optomechanical interactions, enhanced optomechanical interactions, which means that they are, they are like linear interactions. Um, and uh, so the interest maybe of the system is that it's very symmetric. The two branches here are very symmetric. And since the whole non-reciprocal uh, uh, transport effect is based on an interference between the two branches, uh, it's good to have the two branches, I guess, more or less similar so that the interference can be completely destructive, uh, for at least for some conditions. So um, these systems were particularly uh, studied for energy transport uh, and uh, they, are, they were uh, a lot of implementations of here isolators, but also directional amplifiers, and with a slightly more complicated experimental system, also circulators. And uh, they were not so studied, at least when we uh, started this work, for noise propagation. Uh, so, um, uh, and the, when I'm talking about noise here, I'm mainly talking about the mechanical uh, mechanical thermal noise because cavities experimentally, they, they can be quite high frequency. So in, in cryogenic systems, they have very little thermal noise. Mechanical oscillators on the other hand can still be, since they are quite low frequency, quite noisy. And in this uh, paper, which is actually about uh, an optomechanical uh, directional amplifier. We measured the noise of, of this cavity here, which is isolated for, from the other cavity. 
and we measured that uh, the noise is uh, non-negligible. This is because it's uh, there's some noise leaking from the mechanical oscillators into the cavity. But uh, it seems to be canceled here. There seems to be some uh, destructive interference pattern in the noise as well as in the signal propagation. And we explain that in this paper by figuring out that there are three paths for uh, at least at this order of, of development, there are three paths for the noise from uh, to leak from mechanical oscillator one to, to this cavity mode. One very direct one, and uh, there's also the noise that we leak to cavity two, and then uh, take the two paths, uh, the two coupling paths to cavity one. But precisely this coupling path interfere destructively, and this space here is the same for the two uh, for the two paths. So eventually they will interfere destructively and the only noise you get at resonance is the one from this direct path. So noise also interferes destructively in this in these devices. And this maybe gave rise to an idea uh, that these systems could somehow with a destructive interference be used to cool mechanical modes, which is something that is very interesting in optomechanics, we're always trying to find new ways to cool mechanical modes and make them as still as possible. So, um, so there was a paper in 2019 by the group of Jack Harris in Yale that, that proposed to actually revert the, uh, swap the roles of the mechanical modes and of the cavities to uh, engineer a non-reciprocal interaction between uh, mechanical modes using cavities, using actually one cavity. And so they implemented this, uh, this, uh, this design. And for this, they have to mediate four couplings because there are four arrows here. And each coupling in optomechanics is, uh, is promoted by one uh, pump tone. So they sent four pump tones uh, on, inside the cavity. And, uh, and then they measured the mechanical occupations of the two mechanical oscillators in red and blue. And you see that, uh, and then they varied the, the phase of the interference and they, show, they showed that there was a, a modulation of the uh, mechanical occupancy or the mode temperature. So that's a very clear witness that indeed non-reciprocal uh, coupling does something strong to the uh, phononic occupation. And I was quite amazed when I saw this work. And I was wondering, because in the system there are so many uh, tones applied on the uh, lower side of the cavity, which in optomechanics we call the red side. And they are close to the red sideband. I was wondering how much sideband cooling that can be in this experiment. That's a lot of, of cooling applied here. And by the way, I think this experiment was performed at a few kelvins. And you see that the modes are quite cold. So clearly there must be some strong cooling mechanism. And I was wondering in this situation, is it still possible to identify something that one can call non-reciprocal cooling without ambiguity that is not sideband cooling? So what I'm saying is that maybe we want to define some kind of temperature reference here to compare these temperatures and decide if there is some, if, if this is a modulation that's actually above, completely above a reference temperature, or if some parts of it is below, in which case maybe non-reciprocal interaction gives rise to some cooling. So that is the main question that I will answer in this talk. And then, because I, I will give you the answer, there is some non-reciprocal cooling. Uh, we redid ex this experiment with uh, modes that were very close to the quantum regime with very few pho photon, uh, phonons, sorry, uh, to probe if there was a quantum limit to this cooling phenomenon and if we could see it experimentally. So to check if there is non-reciprocal cooling, I will first dig a little bit deeper into the uh, protocol for, for implementing non-reciprocal interaction. So the idea, as we said, is to couple the mechanical modes through two paths. And uh, this means here with two different, uh, using two different frequency uh, components of the cavity field. So in, in red, or the, this, the arrows on the uh, lower side here, uh, uh, you can see that, that you can see this coupling path 
using uh, cavity uh, field frequency a little bit below resonance. And with these two arrows, we can, you, can, you can see a representation of the other coupling path using this cavity field uh, frequency, or the field of the cavity at this frequency, rather. And then if you write the coupling between uh, mode one and mode two, uh, you see that there are two terms indeed, corresponding to each of the two paths and same for coupling of mode two to one. And these two uh, couplings are very similar. They are almost uh, con complex conjugate, except if the uh, KC here, which is the cavity susceptibility, has, uh, it, except if this is complex and has an imaginary part, then these two are not, uh, they are not uh, complex conjugates and the amplitude of T12 and T21 can be different. And this is why the cavity is used out of resonance because this small phase shift uh, allows to uh, break the symmetry between T12 and T21. So it allows non-reciprocity. So this is the trick. Uh, this is the implementation in this system of the trick that uh, Anya mentioned, that there should be some um, dissipative coupling uh, somewhere. So, so uh, to simplify a little bit the, these calculations, I will take a very symmetric uh, situation where all couplings are equal and also the mechanical oscillators are, uh, have the same dissipation rates. And this means for optomechanics that the so-called optomechanical cooperativity is the same for all of these uh, modes. And I will introduce this very important parameter the phase, uh, uh, it's, it's actually the phase accumulated around this loop through all of these couplings. And this phase will control the nature of the interference, so the nature of the coupling. And now that we have the simplified notations, I dare write the uh, coupling, coupling uh, matrix between the two modes. It appears quite simply uh, as a modification of the effective uh, mechanical susceptibility. Uh, and the reason why here we put the I in front and for example, not included it in the cavity, in the, sorry, in the matrix, is that this is the coupling matrix that would appear in a Hamiltonian. So, so this is the real coupling matrix. Or actually it's an imaginary coupling matrix. If you can see all of these couplings are imaginary which uh, means that they, the, the, this uh, total term here is very much like a gamma. It's, it's a real term in total. And, and this is what we call dissipative coupling. Then there are these diagonal terms here, T11 and T22. And if we express them, uh, you can see that they are exactly equal to, to the uh, two sideband cooling terms. So these terms are, they represent some interaction of mode one with itself through a cavity. So in optomechanics, we call that a dynamical back action. And they, they represent exactly sideband cooling. So here is our sideband cooling effect. And the off-diagonal terms are new. They are specific to this system. And they represent inter-mode coupling. And you can see that they have two parts, one that is proportional to cosine of, of phi over two, and which is actually reciprocal. It's the sa same coefficients. And one that is uh, proportional to sine of phi over two and which is non-reciprocal, which means T12 is not equal to T21. So what this means is that by tuning the phase, one can move from a reciprocal coupling picture to a non-reciprocal, a purely non-reciprocal coupling picture with no reciprocal coupling. And uh, then the, the question is, how can, we, this, how can we experimentally measure the effect of T11 and T22, the Simon cooling effect, without having to worry about this T21 and T12 terms, without having their effect on the system, so as to be able to define a temperature reference, a relevant temperature reference with which to compare the final temperature of modes to decide if we have non-reciprocal cooling or not. So how to make T12 and T21 zero. And in fact, we found an experimental uh, trick to do this. Uh, and the trick is to implement this, the, uh, the uh, driving scheme of the, that will allow for non-reciprocal coupling, but slightly detune two of the pump tones. And what this means is that 
the interaction of mode one with uh, one frequency of the cavity, uh, I mean, th this frequency of the cavity will not be the same as the, the frequency that interacts with mode two. So, so mode one will not be coupled to mode two through this, through this cavity field because it's actually two different cavity fields. But they are still very close in frequency, so they still apply more or less the same sideband cooling effect. Because here we only need to detune uh, more than a mechanical line width, and in our system, mechanical line widths are really, really small. They are the smallest frequency scale. Um, okay, so this uh, allows to have the, the exact same back action as in the uh, final experiment where tones are exactly at the intended position. Uh, so I will show you what is the result of this uh, little calibration of a, of a temperature reference. But first, I will talk a little bit about our experimental system. So it's, uh, it's a system that we've used for, for some works in the past, based on a couple of drum, uh, drum resonators made out of aluminum. So it's three aluminum membranes oscillating above uh, a bottom electrode and forming a moving capacitance that is then in integrated with inductors to make a, a microwave cavity. And in our case, actually, there are two modes in this cavity. And one is used to implement this uh, non-reciprocal uh, coupling between mechanical modes. And the other one we use to measure mechanical, mechanical motion, as in fact is done in the Yale paper. Then this system we cool in a cryostat because it's a superconducting uh, aluminum system. So it works only below uh, one Kelvin or so. So we go to quite low temperatures. And meanwhile, the phonon uh, occupancies of the mechanical oscillators are reduced down to 50, 38 phonons for, both, for each of the modes. And then using the, uh, the tones that we use to probe the system and measure mechanical motion, we actually uh, perform a pre-cooling stage, which brings the uh, mechanical modes very close to, to the ground state with two and three phonons respectively. That's just using the auxiliary cavity and then using the cavity intended to apply non-reciprocal coupling by applying the pump tones and using the small uh, the tuning of pump tones to, to measure the temperature reference, uh, as I've shown before, we reach uh, these temperature reference of, or occupancies, reference occupancies of 1.75 here and 2.71 phonons for mode one and mode two. The discrepancy is due to the difficulty at, at this is done with extremely large powers for, for all the tones, it's, it's at this power is bit difficult to control very precisely how, how much you need them. And the actual mechanical oscillators are slightly different, uh, contrary to what we suppose in the theory. So I present here an ideal situation where they would be equal, every coupling would be equal and the dissipation rate of both mechanical oscillators would be the same. And here this is the experimental result where it's actually not completely achieved. And now it's time to move to the experiment. So we'll retune the tones back to the, where they're supposed to, to be to implement non-reciprocal coupling. And I will vary the phase by uh, to, to uh, sweep the coupling from reciprocal to non-reciprocal and study the uh, mechanical occupancy uh, for each point. And we will, we will see what happens. So first, for a phase of zero, for a totally reciprocal coupling, you see that as soon as the modes are coupled, the fluctuations increase quite dramatically. So the reason for this is that, as we mentioned before, these couplings are, uh, so they are the same and they are imaginary. So it, it means also they are dissipative, which in other terms means that the coupling matrix is already non-Hermitian, uh, okay? Because it's, it's, uh, the off-diagonal co components are imaginary and equal. So already in the reciprocal uh, situation, 
the, the fluctuations are a lot higher because this dissipative coupling allows to break the thermal, the effective thermal equilibrium uh, reached, uh, including this uh, sediment cooling effect. And if you have a look at the spectrum of oscillator one and oscillator two, you can get a little bit more precision on how this uh, thermal equilibrium is broken. So each of the spectrum has now two terms. One that is, it's a bit complicated expression, but it's, a, it's actually the usual spectrum uh, of an oscillator. And the other term is uh, appeared when T12 uh, acquired a finite value. And you see that it's proportional to N2 plus one half. So N2 is the population of oscillator two. So these fluctuations clearly come from the other oscillator. So turning on the coupling allowed some additional fluctuations. And the other effect of uh, the, of the uh, coupling is that there's a denominator here, which is expressed here. And it's acquired when we turned on the coupling, uh, a new term here, T1, T2, T2, 1 which if you remember, since they are both imaginary and equal, this term is negative. Oops. So this means that the D here is smaller than its reference value and it's a denominator. So it means that in total, uh, not only we have additional fluctuations, but we are more sensitive to them than in the reference situation. And these two effects increase susceptibility and additional fluctuations add up to, to explain this uh, large occupancies. Then if we increase the phase uh, further, we reach a situation where uh, the, uh, where the one of the coupling, the, the two terms of one of the coupling can, can cancel each other perfectly. So for example, if, if uh, a delta here is a, is a one half, which means that the pantones are detuned by half a cavity line width, then this happens when phi is pi over two. And then you reach a situation where one of the coupling is zero, which uh, is also called isolation. And this is the situation that has been very much studied with uh, non-reciprocal optomechanical systems, because it's the situation that allows for transmission in one direction and no transmission in the other direction. But here you can see that the there is no, there's, it's not maybe so interesting because what we retrieve is that for one mode, we, we have the, sorry, what we get is that for one mode, we retrieve the reference fluctuations as there is no additional fluctuations and the, this denominator his, here has its uh, reference value. And on the other modes, we get still additional fluctuations. So, so it's still quite noisy. And as you see, we, we have no cooling for this situation. However, if we increase the phase a little bit further, um, then we still have quite low additional fluctuations. They were zero just a moment ago. And D, uh, in D, this term here changes sign. It was, if you remember, negative for reciprocal coupling. And now it's been zero in the isolation case. If we increase the phase, it starts to be positive. And D is larger than it was uh, in the reference situation. So what this means is that we have a, a smaller susceptibility and some additional fluctuations. So there's a competition between these two effects. And eventually it's possible for the smaller susceptibility effect to win on a small range of phases. So here, uh, the fluctuations of, of mode one can go a little bit below the reference situation. The reference situation. So this means that there is actually something called non-reciprocal cooling, and it, it was experimentally observed too. But this effect is, uh, is rather weak because it, it results from a competition between these two mechanisms. And finally, when you uh, increase the phase up to pi, then you get something that uh, maybe you want to call maximum non-reciprocity in the sense that the couplings are exactly opposite. Uh, but as they are imaginary and opposite, you retrieve a Hermitian coupling matrix. Uh, so the fluctuations are back at the reference level because this situation doesn't necessarily, or it doesn't break the thermal equilibrium in an ideal case. Uh, and you can think of this situation as, I think this is Daniel's word, that is, it, it, 
you can think of it as mutual opposite feedback between mechanical oscillators. So the fluctuations of one go to the other and the fluctuations of the other go to the one, but they exactly compensate. Maybe this can be seen as a chiral uh, situation where there is a maximum, well, there's non-reciprocity and chirality. So yeah, I don't know. Um, okay, so uh, to summarize what we found by sweeping the phase, we found that reciprocal coupling links leads to increased fluctuations. Non-reciprocal coupling, a maximum non-reciprocal coupling leads to same fluctuations as in thermal equilibrium. Isolation is not a super special situation for this system, although it's the one that's been very studied for uh, energy transport. And non-reciprocal cooling exists, and it exists for an intermediate coupling between reciprocal and non-reciprocal, although it's more towards non-reciprocal. And it's quite small because it, because it results from a competition between increased fluctuations and modulated susceptibility. The fluctuations, the additional fluctuations are always positive, but the susceptibility is, can be more or less than the reference susceptibility. And then I'll have a quick last word on the on mechanical uh, on the quantum limits of this phenomenon. So it turns out that mechanical quantum fluctuations are distributed just in the same way as thermal fluctuations. So there could be some hope that this fluctuations are reduced as well, and that maybe you can reach below half a phonon. But uh, to, to, to check the, the quantum limit, we have to take all uh, quantum fluctuations into account. And what I've omitted up to now is the quantum back action from microwave pump tones used to implement the non-reciprocal coupling. And this back action is, there are several terms. There's the standard one, that you also get in a Simon cooling experiment. And then since the modes are coupled, there's also some back action that, that is applied on mode two that will leak back to mode one. And because these two terms are, uh, are they come from the same uh, cavity field, they, they interfere together. And it turns out eventually that cavity quantum fluctuations, if you want to attribute them to, to cavity and mechanics, they are distributed in a way that exactly completes the mechanical quantum fluctuation uh, distribution to make up one quantum of uh, fluctuation. So eventually, this is a very complicated way to calculate one half. And the quantum limit of this phenomenon is half a phonon just as Simon cooling. And with this, I, I will conclude. So non-reciprocal cooling, uh, we, we've seen that this, this exists, uh, or, or one can define it this way, for a coupling that's intermediate between non-reciprocal and reciprocal. And I haven't really talked about it much, but in this state, uh, this, this state corresponds to a steady state that, in fact, cannot be described by an effective temperature in the sense that the uh, there is no temperature that will allow to recover the fluctuation dissipation relation. So when I, I have been talking about cooling, I've been a bit uh, loose with the terms, but I meant uh, fluctuations reduction. And uh, the, I will justify why this system is a refrigerator, although we haven't so much talked about it either. It turns out that works actually needed from the pump tones to implement the cooling. And this is why the isolation is not a good situation because you can calculate that the work rates in that situation applied on the isolated mode is zero. So uh, very much like a refrigerator, uh, we, need this, we need this work to come from pump tones. And finally, uh, we've shown in the last slide that only thermal fluctuations are sensitive to this non-reciprocal coupling. I'm not talking about the situation that uh, Anya mentioned, which, uh, which uh, I think might require some uh, interaction terms that don't conserve uh, a number of excitation. Here, it's, I've been only using red tones, which, which only allow for beam splitter kind uh, Hamiltonian, which conserve excitation. So in this case, only thermal fluctuations are sensitive to non-reciprocal coupling. And as a consequence, uh, the total occupancies modulation seem to be squashed when you go to low occupancies, which justifies to perform this experiment at low phonon numbers. 
where uh, quantum back action terms are necessary to, to understand why the, why the modulation is, is not as much as you would expect without these back action terms. And with this, I would, I would like to thank my team. And I've been working on this project with Mika and Kaspar, and also uh, with all of these persons. So Daniel, Andreas, Clara, and, and Matteo. And thank you for listening. And sorry for being a bit late. Thank you for this very nice talk, Flor. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, um, there's maybe very little time for questions. Maybe if there's a very quick one, you can raise your hand now. Um, but I mean, I, I can't see one at this moment. Um, so maybe it would be best if you, if you have any residual questions that you're just forming in your mind, just post them in chat and I'm sure Laure is going to be very happy to answer them. Um, so let, let us uh, thank Laura again for, for giving this very nice talk and for the amazing experimental results. And with that, I think we should move on um, to our next speakers. Um, Laure, please and share. Yeah, thanks. And our next speaker, uh, Florent, uh, Florent Lacroix, can you please start sharing? Um, is an experimentalist and a research associate at uh, NIST in, in Boulder, in the USA. And he's going to tell us about, um, sorry, no, I just disappeared, parametric non reciprocity for quantum information processing with superconducting circuits. So we can leaving the optical mechanics paradigm for a, a moment. Uh, the floor is yours, Florent. Great, thank you. Um, can you see the slide? All right. Yes, yeah, yeah. We can see it. Okay, great. Perfect, thank you. Well, um, thanks everyone for joining and thanks for the invitation. I'm really happy to be able to talk about some of the work we've done over here in the US at NEST. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about non-reciprocity, um, but from the very pragmatic point of view of a quantum engineer, uh, why do we need it and how do we use it for quantum computing in general? So I'm going to start with a quick intro about quantum computing. On the left, I'm showing the uh, five so-called DiVincenzo criteria for a universal quantum computer. And on the right, a, a maybe now a little bit outdated picture of a chip from the UCSB Google group that I like because it's uh, still easy to point at the constituent of, of these devices. And mainly you have five transmon qubits in a row. Each one of them are nonlinear LC oscillators uh, so that you can uh, um, address the zero in one state individually for your computational subspace. And they have resonance in the four to eight gigahertz kind of, a, kind of frequency. That allows you to pretty easily uh, uh, check off the initialization box because they get cooled to their ground state when you put them in the dilution refrigerator, uh, where at 10 millikelvin, you have KVT that is much, much smaller than H bar on my back. Now, their coherence is uh, steadily improving. Uh, it's still not quite there yet, but it's getting to interesting thresholds for quantum error correction, for example. The dates are performed by sending microwave pulses through individual control line, either for controlling uh, the complex superposition between zero and one, or um, the qubit frequency and perform two qubit gates, for example. Now, the measurement, is uh, done using these individual readout resonators. The way it works is um, that these resonators, these cavities, inherit a little bit of the nonlinearity of the qubit, which makes them have two different resonance frequency um, for the ground and excited state of the qubit. And so if you probe them on resonance by sending microwave tone, you will pick up a qubit state dependent phase shift of your uh, outgoing microwave signal. The problem is because that comes from inherited nonlinearity, um, you're typically limited to low readout power. And, and what I call low is maybe a few photons or, or minus 120 dBm of microwave power. And that requires um, a very low noise measurement chain. And that's a typical uh, uh, diagram of what these measurements should look like. And then most of them start with a parametric amplifier, which um, are pretty much quantum limited amplifiers. They will amplify with uh, the least amount of noise added uh, allowed by quantum mechanics. 
But their main issue is that they work in reflection. And in order to control signal flow and guide the noise away from the device, we need to break reciprocity and we use a lot of microwave spectrum that is for that. And here I put four, some experiment at five, some experiment at three, uh, but that's kind of a, a few circulators per line is kind of the right number. Now, these circulators have a lot of flaws. Uh, Anya has talked about that uh, a little bit earlier in this session. And you know, the most obvious one is their size. Um, they are typically size of, of wavelengths at degree of frequency, so centimeters kind of size. And um, we all use that PR picture from IBM, um, where you can see a lot of the real estate in the fridge is taken up by these circulators. Um, to be fair, uh, as I said, this is a PR picture. I don't think there's a qubit in there, but it would have to hide inside that magnetic shield to be protected from these uh, uh, isolators. And there's not even anywhere close to the right numbers that you would need for uh, being able to use microwave amplifiers uh, um, and protect your device from the amount of noise. You maybe have like half of what they actually need on that picture. So um, that's going to really prevent scalability in the long term. Now, there are also two other issues in circulators. One is magnetic field. As I said, it's not compatible with superconductivity, so you can't have that integrated with your, your foreign device of interest. And, and we'll talk about that in the next slide, and then I will uh, switch over to talking about the loss and the, 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 the effect of, of loss on measurement efficiency. So the magnetic field, um, as I said, it can be integrated, and that prevents a lot of interesting experiments. There's been a lot of theoretical work on what could you do with large networks of qubits coupled with non-reciprocal interactions, and only like a handful of, of experimental demonstrations. Uh, even more recently, there have been new types of qubits that have been proposed where um, you would couple two, for example, here two qubits with a gyrator, and um, the ground state of that system turned out to be GKP code words, so uh, um, some, some way to encode quantum information with inherent noise biases and, and protection. Now, uh, the issue I'm going to be uh, talking most about today is the issue of loss and measurement efficiency. So here I'm going back to my dispersive readout picture, uh, but this time with a 3D transmon, it's kind of the same uh, thing that I was showing earlier. You inject a microwave signal into that cavity, it comes out entangled with um, the state of the qubit. Now, every non idea is in your microwave measurement, whether it is dissipation or excess noise, they all conspire to corrupt the entanglement. And that can be characterized by a single number, the efficiency between zero and one. Now, if all you care about is state discrimination, you will do a homodyne measurement of your output signal, and you will measure two different distribution of your homodyne signal, depending on whether you're in the ground or excited state. You can actually write a fairly simple formula for what the Qubit measurement fidelity is going to be in absence of relaxation. And it's an error function um, that depends on um, your measurement efficiency, but also your integration time and your measurement strength, gamma and gamma. And so what you can see is even with moderate measurement efficiency, you can still achieve large qubit fidelity if you can integrate for a long time or measure stronger. And case in point are uh, trust ions with records in uh, qubit measurement fidelity with um, a very, very low efficiency. But if you want to actually reuse an entanglement to do some sort of quantum, quantum feedback loop, whether it is to control back the qubit you are measuring, or if you want to distribute that entanglement to another quantum system uh, for remote entanglement, for example, well, that efficiency becomes a critical metric and the main metric of interest. And if we look at like a typical measurement chain, you have again these series of isolators of circulators and, and parametric amplifiers. What really destroys your measurement efficiency is the fact that because these cannot be integrated with the quantum system of interest, you need a lot of cables, connectors, and all that compounded by the loss within the circulator that you get efficiencies that are typically in the tens of percent, with some hero experiments that have reached 50 or maybe even 
but with not much more margin to, to make that better. So that has motivated for us the development of, of some sort of integrated amplifier so that we can really provide gain right at the output of the cavity or even within the cavity to overwhelm the loss of whatever comes after. And to do that, we kind of took a step back and, and, and look at how, how does the circulator work? Well, the first thing you can do is open the uh, microwave Bible from Posar and you find that diagram. Um, you have here three strip line conductors and you have a, a disc at the center that's sandwiched between two ferrite discs under a magnetic field. Um, and the Faraday effect at that point um, make counter uh, uh, clockwise and clockwise circulating signal require different phase shifts. Now, if you send a signal at the input, it can, for properly tuned parameter, constructively interfere at the output, but destructively interfere towards that isolated point, bringing up the circulation. You can identify the necessary ingredients. In this. You need an interferometer, you need some sort of non-reciprocal phase shift. And the way we're going to do that is by uh, using superconducting resonators as the different nodes coupled to each other via parametric interaction. And here doing that with some sort of a microwave cartoon of how one can pick your hard work. A lot of that theory had been worked out kind of five or six years ago by Anya and Ash, and as well as Leonardo and, and Jeremy Kevin. Yeah. So, um, I mentioned the, the critical component is parametric coupling between, between these modes. And I'm going to get into a little bit of detail why, why that matters. Um, and for that, let's step back to just mass on springs. You have two mass on springs here, two different mechanical resonators with different resonant frequency because they have different mass. And you connect them through a coupling spring K. Um, pardon my uh, uh, lack of hats on, on my operators, but this is a, a, a form of a interaction Hamiltonian, which cares about the difference of position square. If I move to, um, to creation and elevation operators and expand this and throw out the renormalization term, I end up with kind of a position position coupling. Now, uh, because these two um, oscillators have different resonance frequency, the time average of that, of that uh, Hamiltonian goes to zero and you, you end up with very weak residual dispersive coupling between the two, no real uh, energy exchange because they're not in frequency. But now if I allow myself to uh, um, modulate the value of that coupling constant at some frequency omega p, I can find situation where that time average will not go down to zero, leading to net coupling that is proportional to the strength of that modulation of, of the coupling constant. Um, and this, this, the first case for where, where that happens is if I modulate at the difference frequency between the two resonators, that gives me an exchange interaction, maybe dagger, dagger, dagger. That's my frequency conversion term. Now, the other option is to uh, drive at the sum frequency, which leads to an A, B, A dagger, B dagger term, which is amplitude amplification. Importantly, you can see that now that that coupling spring is now a complex number, and you carry that phase of that modulation in that interaction. And you can imagine, for example, picking up a phase from up conversion from a B to A, but picking the opposite phase when you down convert from A to B. And that's going to be the building blocks for what we call the field programmable Jordison amplifier. So um, we're not doing mass on springs, we're doing LC oscillators. And here we're putting three LC oscillators in, in parallel, which gives rise to three resonances, which, which we call A, B, and C. Now, they all tune with the value of that inductor here, which if we modulate that, that the difference of the sum frequency between any given pair of these nodes, we can turn on coupling edges between these A, B, and C. Now, interestingly, we can also modulate with three different frequencies at the same time to close the loop. And you can already see uh, that interferometer building up where you have now two paths to go from A to B. Uh, and that non-reciprocal phase shift due to the parameter interaction. In practice, we don't do uh, tunable inductors, we do squids. 
um, that's our uh, de facto tunable inductor in superconducting circuits. And the knob is the uh, flux that we can thread through it. In the real world, it looks like that. Uh, that's an SEM picture of a niobium aluminum niobium trilayer chip. Not going to go into too much detail, but you have a gradimetric squid here at the bottom with its own gradimetric uh, control line. And you have a bunch of lumped elements, a pilot plate capacitor, some cone inductor and capacitor on one side, and another one on the other side, as well as capacity to ground and capacity to some uh, uh, control uh, signal line. Now, um, we also added some filtering so that we can separate the, the modes based on the frequency to different physical ports, an input port on the left and output port on the left. Um, the first thing we do is we cool that down to dimension switch temperature and measure the resonance frequency as a function of the flux of the squid. You can see they all assume with flux and end up in the 4 to 12 gigahertz band. In the next slide in the rest of the talk, I'm going to fix the flux bias kind of at a, a given DC flux where the mode are around 7, 8, and 11 gigahertz with line widths in kind of the tens of megahertz tuned up by this capacity. Now, what I'm going to show you is how we can program the scattering parameters of such a device using different uh, microwave forms to modulate the screen. Down. The first thing we can do is turn on that first building block, the frequency conversion, by just modulating the inductance at the different frequency, let's say between A and C mode here. You can measure the scattering parameter. So there's two modes, it's a two by two matrix. Um, and for the diagonal term, it's your reflection coefficient, which both go to zero when you are on resonance, you are in tennis match, there is no reflection off of this port. And the cross term are the transmission term from A to C and C to A, which both approach unity uh, close to resonance. Now we can do the same frequency conversion between also mode A and B and B and C, but more importantly, we can do it with all three at the same time. And so for the right pump strength and relative phase between the two, we can have a device that behaves like a circular. Still no reflection at the input and output, uh, but you have unity transmission from A to C, but no uh, 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 transmission from C to So that's really the behavior of your circular. Now, from there, we could um, just go ahead and grab what, one of our parametric amplifier and connect it to it and try to, to measure stuff with it. But it turned out there's something even a little more clever we can do, which is to directly add that gain process within that same system. That just consists of adding a force pump that this time is at twice the frequency of the B node, and that will create a device that behaves really much like this diagram here, the JP on the circular. The uh, uh, scattering uh, parameters are shown here. It's still impedance match, so no reflection and resonance. But now, in the forward direction, you uh, a signal of omega C gets converted to omega B, amplified with phase sensitive gain, and come out omega A. And so that's your strong forward gain from C to A. The other way around, it goes from A to C with a unity transmission. So, uh, that's a phase sensitive process. I'm not going to have time to get into the detail of how that works here. Um, but I would like to just wrap up a little bit about what we call that FPJA um, three resonators, one squid, or two or parametric coupling that we can just program with uh, a set of pumps, either to do frequency conversion or any sort of amplification. And with more pumps, we can add directionality to it. And the, the last one that I just showed, the directional phase sensitive amplifier, is the one we're going to be most interested in when it comes to uh, doing high efficiency qubit measurements. Indeed, because it's phase sensitive, you get to uh, approach the uh, uh, unity efficiency. So, um, back to that, that diagram where I was showing you where all the losses are and the circulators and so on, what we're going to do is insert that non reciprocal phase sensitive amplifier right at the output of the cavity before any of the loss occurs. And hopefully, we can provide enough uh, um, forward gain for, uh, for this to work. Now, um, 
I'm showing you again the similar, uh, um, a similar diagram here. I'm going to walk you through what these signals do. I send a signal here at the output of the FPGA. It gets up converted to the frequency of the cavity and reflects off with a qubit state dependent phase shift. And then gets down converted back to the output frequency, but with phase sensitive gain. Right. So, how do we characterize the uh, efficiency of such a measurement? Well, there is an actual, uh, a very robust method to do that, um, which is to compare the rate at which you acquire information about the qubit state and um, the rate at which the qubit itself is being measured. And that turns into a measurement induced dephasing. Rate. In your perfect world, all of the dephasing of the qubit is due to your measurement, due to you learning about the qubit state. And so it is two are equal and get to an efficiency of it. So um, here's what the data look like. You have a, uh, um, the way you acquire the measurement rate is as follow. You prepare your qubit in the ground or excited state. And then you perform a weak measurement where you integrate your signal for a duration time tau with a measurement strength alpha. And you, recover histograms for your ground and excited state. And from their separation compared to their widths, compared to their widths, you get a signal to noise ratio. You can compare that to the integration time to get a measurement rate. How fast do these histograms separate in time? Now, what I'm putting here is that measurement rate as a function of the measurement strength and values gain for our non reciprocal amplifier. Um, in all cases, that measurement rate goes up linearly with measurement strength. But we can also see that as we increase gain, we increase our measurement rate. And the goal is to reach that dashed line, which is the measurement duty phasing rate that we characterize on the left. To do that, we uh, perform a Ramsey sequence in presence of a, a, that, that same weak measurement. And we then get Ramsey fringes. And from the decay rate, we can extract all the various contribution uh, that leads to decohere. And so that I'm putting here the decay rate as a function of that measurement strength. You have a small contribution from just the relaxation time of the qubit. You have a linear contribution from the measurement rate, uh, a measurement, measurement rate, the measurement induced phase rate at the same dash line down here. And uh, you also have a constant value here that comes from. Uh, residual thermal occupation in the cavity that you can see increases a bit with gain because we are amplifying a little bit the, uh, uh, the state in the cavity, even though we don't want to. There's some limited isolation to the amplifier. So you can convert that into real units of measuring strength and, and, and photon number. And um, you can combine these sets of two measurements to uh, get to a measurement efficiency, so the ratio of the two. That's what I'm showing in green here, as a function of the gain of that first stage of amplification. When it's, there's no gain, we're limited by the efficiency of the rest of the chain, uh, which is about 20% in our know, case. And then as we increase gain, we approach kind of record efficiency around 70, 75% uh, measurement efficiency. At the same time, as I said, we limited isolation means the uh, uh, cavity temperature goes up a bit and so that we use what we call an environmental efficiency. Now, um, where do we go from there? We're pretty happy with that. Um, we, we know pretty much how to solve that with our isolation. And our simulation tells us just increasing the output mode line width will actually increase the isolation and get rid of that problem. It's pretty trivial to do. And what we really are excited about is the fact that we understand fairly well our efficiency budget. We know where to go to improve measurement efficiency. We have a little bit of, of signal leaking through weekly coupled port. We have a little bit of signal leaking through some of the amplifier mode, the B mode that provides the gain. And, and we have a little bit of packaging that we can work on. So this is what kind of the packaging look like. You have that 3D cavity with the trend one in it. And then uh, you have that FPGA package here with a filter in between to pro uh, protect from complicity. Um, that's a lot of modes. You have a qubit coupled to a resonator, coupled to an input mode of the FPGA, three modes of the FPGA here, and the signal input output. 
we are working on simplifying that quite a bit by just going to uh, uh, and getting rid of that extraneous resonator to make you now a, a readout cavity with built-in detection equipment. That's what we're working on. And um, you know, I'm going to flash a, a, a we're at the stage of modeling and fabricating these devices. This is kind of what it's going to look like. You have a 3D post cavity here at the center that is coupled to a transmon qubit on the left and to a copper chip on the right that gives uh, rise to the two other modes A and B that we need. And now we can, uh, uh, and that has a squid for modulation. We can now uh, produce such a copy. Um, we're fabricating it. Um, we have design targets that seem pretty feasible of 10 dB of key rate gain over 10 megahertz, so that's 16 dB of quadrature gain roughly. And uh, we hope to get efficiency upward of 90% in fidelity uh, above 99%. Uh, with that, I'm just going to conclude and uh, um, you know, tell you that I've, I've talked to you a little bit about parametric manuscrosity and how it works how we apply it to qubit measurement uh, for critical efficiencies and uh, future direction uh, when it comes to integration of, of that reciprocity really within the package, application to quantum feedback, uh, as well as uh, um, kind of new projects that involve non reciprocal qubit, qubit cup. And um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank everybody in the group that has participated in that project, and I'm uh, happy to take questions. Cool, great. Uh, thanks, Florent, uh, Florent, for this nice talk. Um, I'm not sure if we have any questions yet. I haven't seen any. So, I don't know, there's uh, Diego Porras, you raise your hand. Diego, do you want to say something? Actually, ah. Yeah, uh, thank you for the for the talk. It was very interesting. I was I was wondering whether uh, do you think it makes sense uh, or do you see any advantage in having a coupled uh, just have some amplifiers of the kind that you have presented? Does do you think you gain something by 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 having kind of a, a directional amplifier scheme by by having more than one? Couple together, or or would it? Uh, what, what is your? Or is it better to focus on having a very good single amplifier rather than a, a chain of amplifiers? Um, well, it's always a, we're always going to end up using a chain of amplifiers to some extent because uh, even like some of the stuff I don't show is that at room temperature there is more amplification and then more amplification. And um, you need something of the order of maybe 100 dB of gain, uh, maybe even a tad more than that overall between your single photon to something you can actually digitize at some temperature. And having a single amplifier doing 100 dB of gain is really unlikely. Um, compression and, and, and power limitation will just um, uh -huh. make, make that breakdown. So there's always going to be some sort of cascaded a chain of amplifiers with the first one as the lowest noise and just enough gain to overwhelm the noise of the next stage amplifier, which has higher noise, but higher compression and so on and so on. And you cascade these things. Uh -huh. um, that's why, for example, for this one, we're not um, trying to get something that is more than 10 dB of gain because we don't really need to. It becomes a little tricky to tune as you get to higher gain, especially for these parametric amplifiers where uh, you always get close to your clip. Uh, it's always a, a kind of a positive feedback where um, you are always getting close to some sort of runaway parametric uh, uh, amplification. And if you want 10 dB of gain, you're maybe 10% away from that threshold. If you want 20 dB of gain, you're 1% away. If you're 30 dB of gain, you're 0.1% away from that threshold and so on and so on. So it becomes really unstable. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I think there's maybe time for one quick question. Uh, Martina, do you want to go next? I think you were the second person. I'm not sure if you can unmute yourself, actually. Um, can someone do it? I can't do it. Oh, OK. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, great. 
Um, thank you very much, Flora, for the talk. I have a question. It was a great talk. I have a question about the um, bandwidth of your uh, non-reciprocal amplifier. And if uh, the fact that you have many modes involved somehow is limiting your bandwidth or uh, is not a problem at all? Um, so the bandwidth is limited in the sense that uh, it's only going to be kind of a single qubit measure. Um, it doesn't, you can't really multiplex anyway because it's phase sensitive, so it really works only at one frequency. Um, ah, but right, the bandwidth right, is, okay. it, it's, it's, fa it's fast enough for qubit measurement. It's like 7 to 10 megahertz, which is uh, um, typically fast enough for, um, for qubit measurement anyway. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. With that, let, let us thank the speaker again. Uh, thanks, Flora, for the nice talk. Um, please don't share. There, I saw there's more questions. Um, maybe just post them in chat and Florent, I'm sure, is very happy to answer them. Um, but it would be fair to for the next speaker to move on. Um, our next speaker is Keiji Fang um, from the University of Illinois. And he's an experimentalist who, were, who was mentioned in some of the work already that was talked about today. So we're very excited to have him speak now. Um, please start your presentation. And the word is yours. Thank you. All right. Uh, can you see my slides? Uh, no, not yet. You have to share. I think I can't oh. see anything. Right. Hold on. Yeah, now I'm seeing something. Yep. It's not full screen yet. All right. Now it is. Yeah. And we can see your cursor. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Please go. All right, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I'm at uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign now. And uh, so today I'll talk about some uh, topology effects in dynamic and modulated, as well as optical mechanical systems I have dealt with uh, in the past almost 10 years now. So, um, so the, the talk will divide into roughly two parts. The first is about uh, um, topology of photonics in dynamic modulated systems. And second one will be some new work from my own group um, about uh, a, a new type of optical mechanical system that involve bound state in the continuum. So I guess uh, uh, throughout the many talks, this uh, um, this message about uh, you know synthetic magnetic field, synthetic gauge field via uh, modulation phase is well delivered. So uh, I'll just spend a short time uh, to uh, 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 reiterate that. So, um, so when I was a PhD student at uh, uh, Shanghai Finance Group at Stanford University, we, we are looking at uh, time, uh, time modulated, dynamic modulated sy photonic systems. And the interest there is to sort of invent uh, uh, optical isolator without, without using magneto optic effect. So we look at this, uh, um, uh, so this is a sort of a, a, a example where uh, we can, you can imagine we have two resonators, optical resonators uh, with different frequency, omega A and omega B. And uh, uh, if, we t if we have some spatial modulation in between them and the modulation frequency that matches, uh, matches the frequency difference of the two resonator, then uh, the photons or is that modulation will induce some effective coupling between the two resonator. And the photons then can couple or hop between the two resonators. And uh, uh, under rotating wave approximation, meaning the uh, uh, effect coupling G is much smaller than the frequency difference of the two resonator, uh, then the uh, interaction between the two resonators can be approximated by this uh, uh, Hamiltonian. And then you see immediately see that uh, um, the modulation phase right, enters into this Hamiltonian. And uh, uh, if you compare this Hamiltonian with the electronic tight binding model, you realize this phase, this modulated phase, is actually equivalent to a sort of gauge field. So this is a, a, a sort of building block we used to create an effect magnetic field for photons in space. Of course, this phase for a single pair of resonators, this phase is sort of artificial. Uh, you can gauge it away by changing time reference or uh, defining a phase for the operators. But however, if you can uh, uh, set up a resonator lattice, and uh, 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 um, impose this kind of modulation between each pair of nearest neighbor resonators. 
and have the phase uh, synchronized, uh, have the modulation synchronized, then you, you realize that this phase is no longer uh, arbitrary and the relative phase uh, is no longer arbitrary and it is fixed. So, uh, so if you wish, you can, uh, you can uh, assign such kind of phase distribution in a resonant lattice and write down the tight abiding uh, Hamiltonian for this lattice. And then it is, uh, it becomes, uh, uh, it is assembles that uh, uh, of electrons under uniform magnetic field. So this is our model system. And uh, uh, interestingly, uh, uh, and not surprisingly, we are able to um, uh, produce very interesting light uh, beam steering effect in such, such kind of uh, uh, modulated resonant lattices. Uh, for example, we can create a, a cyclotron motion of the beam, right? Uh, imagine uh, in this lattice, in the left-hand side, there are no synthetic magnetic field, meaning all the modulation frequency is the same. On the right-hand side of the uh, lattice, there is a uniform magnetic field, effect magnetic field. Um, then if we shoot light from left to right as it enters into the uh, uh, region with magnetic field, it will cur uh, uh, curve around. And this resembles uh, cyclotron motion with electrons. And uh, moreover, um, th in this kind of finite lattice, we can also have one-way edge mode, all right? So uh, 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 we, we can create a band gap in this uh, uh, resonant lattice. And as a light uh, with a frequency uh, within the uh, band gap, it will excite a edge mode on this final lattice. And this edge mode, the direction, uh, propagation direction of the, uh, this edge mode is only, uh, is one, uh, is unidirectional. And uh, even if it uh, encounters some defect, where the defect here means the resonant frequency is detuned, uh, it will uh, go around uh, this defect without a reflection. Okay, all these are done uh, via uh, type any model. So, um, so, but you can imagine uh, if we, want to experimentally realize this kind of uh, uh, theoretical model, it will be quite challenging, right? You need a, you know, a, a large lattice of resonators and you need them to be frequency, kind of frequency aligned. And uh, you, then you need to sort of fabricate, make uh, resonators uh, in between each pair of uh, nearest neighbor resonators. So that's quite challenging. So what kind of, uh, um, you know, simpler, simpler system we can build to illustrate this kind of idea Oh, since I can make a few. Um, so that, uh, uh, that uh, um, comes to the optomechanical work I uh, performed at uh, Caltech. Um, so optomechanical interaction is effectively a modulation uh, to the light. So basically is that you can use uh, uh, the mechanical vibrations to, uh, to change the frequency of the object cavity, right? So, uh, so this uh, in this work we are using this kind of nano beam auto mechanical crystal cavity, which supports a optical um, uh, cavity mode and a mechanical breathing mode, and uh, uh, they couple via the radiation pressure force. So the interaction between the two is captured by this kind of uh, parametric coupling uh, interaction, right? A, a dagger A is the operator for the optical mode, and B is uh, uh, for the mechanical mode. So. Uh, so then uh, typically uh, operating the kind of optomechanical cavity, you use, you use a parametric pump to linearize this Hamiltonian. So after you linearize the Hamiltonian, you find uh, uh, the, well, this, this linear Hamiltonian is for the case that uh, the pump is uh, ready tuned. So you get this kind of beam splitter Hamiltonian and you find the, uh, the face of the parametric pump is encoded into, this, uh, into the effect coupling. Okay, so this is in the same way as I showed before, where dynamic modulation can give you a, a, a non reciprocal phase, right? The non reciprocity is basically as a phonon upper converted to a, a cavity photon. It acquires phase phi, but for a cavity photon down converted to a phonon, it will acquire phase uh, um, minus phi. Okay, so this is non reciprocal. And of course, for a single cavity, this phase is, uh, is uh, uh, ambiguous, right? You can simply redefine the time, uh, uh, the time reference such that absorb this phase away. But if you have two cavities and have two pumps with uh, uh, synchronized, uh, uh, synchronized phase, then, uh, then the right phase between two pumps is no longer arbitrary. And that's where we can observe this kind of non-reciprocity. Okay, 
So uh, this, is, this is experiment, uh, experiment work uh, uh, has been previously mentioned by Anya. So I'll uh, just uh, uh, recap it a little bit. So this is the mechanical circuit we made in silicon in uh, uh, microchip. And we have two optomechanical negative cavities connected by a uh, waveguide. And this waveguide supports both photons and uh, phonon modes. Okay, so basically the cavity, uh, right and left, uh, left and right cavity is, uh, you know, uh, connect, connected, uh, coupled both mechanically and optically, right? So if you want to uh, illustrate this kind of setup, well, you can imagine uh, each cavity has a, um, a optical mode and a mechanical mode. Then between the two optical modes, there is a waveguide mediated optical coupling. And between the two mechanical modes, there is a, uh, again, this is a waveguide mediated mechanical coupling. And uh, within each cavity, the photon and phonon mode, uh, they couple via the parametric pump. So you kind of form a, uh, uh, a four node, uh, um, four node mini lattice. And uh, uh, between each, each node, there is a sort of coupling. And uh, um, within the same cavity, the optical, uh, optical and mechanical mode, they are coupled via, uh, have this non-reciprocal uh, phase coupling. And uh, so, so now if you study the light propagating through this sort of mini lattice for the forward and backward uh, direction, the light actually sees uh, different, acquires different uh, uh, propagation phase due to this uh, uh, parametric coupling, okay? So, uh, and certainly we can coin this as a vacuum magnet flux, a magnet flux threading this uh, uh, black cat. Um, so, so that's our uh, theoretical idea. Um, so then we carry out the experiment. We made this uh, um, circuit and uh, uh, actually uh, tuned the uh, frequency of the two cap here to be well aligned within the line width, both mechanically and optically. And then measure the, uh, characterize the uh, light transmission through this circuit for the forward and backward propagation directions. And here uh, on the right, what we'll show is the experiment data. Uh, showing the trans transmission uh, ratio for the two directions. And we do, and then we can also cause change the relative phase between, between two pumps, effectively tuning the magnetic flux, right? So uh, then we observe uh, at some point, at some frequency for some uh, effect magnetic flux, the uh, contrast extinction ratio is even larger than 35 dB, uh, which is pretty, uh, pretty high. And this kind of behavior can be well modeled by our by this uh, couple couple model theory. And you see there is a in order to achieve the maximum uh, uh, extinction ratio, you kind of have uh, two uh, uh, two uh, con uh, conditions. One is for the magnetic flux, which has to be uh, non-zero, and uh, hopefully pi over two. Uh, that can of course be tuned by uh, convenient tuned by the pump phase. And the, another is a matching condition, uh, which uh, relates to the uh, 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 the sort of static coupling between the two cavity with the parametric coupling strength as well as the dissipation rate of the mechanical mode. So here the dissipation rate enters this sort of matching condition. Uh, we think this, uh, this kind of behavior is also governed by the uh, best engineering, right? So if you can tune, uh, if you can change the dissipation rate of the mechanical mode, you can change the behavior of the device. Um, so, okay, so, Still, uh, this optomechanical uh, demonstration involves only two optomechanical cavities. And, and, and as I mentioned, it is uh, quite challenging to have a large uh, lattice with multiple, multiple resonators with aligned frequencies. So there recently, in the recent few years, there is a, uh, a very smart way to actually, then, uh, to actually achieve a la effectively large lattice. And this is uh, um, proposed by Sun Group at Stanford University again. And they are uh, uh, they are considering a ring resonator, a ring resonator, a large ring resonator, which supports both clockwise and counterclockwise modes. And the ring is very large, so the, there are lots of modes with equal uh, that's equally spaced in frequent space. And then you can imagine if you have some electro-optical modulators that uh, 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 with frequency equals the the free spectral uh, free spectral range of the uh, of the ring modes. Then this modulation will actually induce a coupling between all these different uh, uh, propagating, propagating resonances. Okay, so effectively you can imagine you build up a ladder. Uh, uh, each blue dot is a clockwise uh, uh, rotating resonance, and a red is a counterclockwise resonance. 
and the modulation will induce a coupling between uh, within a ladder and uh, uh, imagine you can also have a some bump on the range and that will cause a hybridization between the C, uh, CW and CCW resonance. So you get a lattice in this way. And then uh, by controlling phase of electroorganic modulator, you can control the magnetic flux threading up. Okay. So this is quite a smart way to create a, a large lattice in a synthetic dimension, right? So this is a synthetic dimension. So, um, so, um, so up then, um, so after I went to uh, come to uh, University of Illinois, we are uh, uh, in my own group. We are also thinking about: Is there any way uh, to review some interesting, uh, maybe topology effect in a system without using any cavity, without any using any cavity? So the sort of experiment demonstration would be much easier. So indeed, we look at this very general problem. Uh, we we are looking at a sort of continuum, right? It could be a um, uh, for example, a photon crystal without any cavity. And uh, uh, within with some spatially uh, varying modulations. Uh, and that uh, to describe this system, the mathematical equation is very simple. It's just the Maxwell equation. Now the permittivity of the curve is both uh, spatially and timely dependent. Okay? And uh, we impose this, uh, this, uh, this uh, time varying modulation is uh, uh, basically a cosine function. Okay? It's, uh, it's a periodic. So, so this is a starting point. Uh, to solve this mathematical problem, basically you can use the Flacassian theorem and uh, then decompose this, uh, this uh, electromagnetic field into harmonics uh, of this modulation frequency. All right, so then uh, it purely becomes a uh, numerical problem. <clears throat> if you have uh, sufficient uh, uh, numerical resources, you can certainly solve this problem. But now the, the non-trivial question is that can we review some topological effect in this kind of a uh, uh, continuum, uh, modular continuum similar to the uh, modulated resonant lattices? So uh, we consider a simple two-band model, right? Two-band model. Imagine we have two bands, and then uh, uh, then you can simplify this Maxwell equation uh, to this kind of two-band coupled um, uh, equations. And indeed, you, you find that in this couple of couple of band equation, there is this, the 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 uh, modulation phase enters in a non reciprocal way, right? So in the first equation is phi, in the second equation is minus phi. So this is very similar uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the two coupled uh, resonators, except here the phi is could be continuous in space, right? Spatially dependent phi. So, uh, so with some derivation, with some work, uh, we can derive actually an effect of magnetic field to be associated with each band. So this is this is given uh, given uh, given the um, effect of gauge field um, in space. Okay. So again, this is a spatially uh, it could be continuously varying in space, not necessary to be localized uh, uh, at a certain point. Okay. So, um, so to give a special example. We consider this type of uh, uh, photonic uh, photonic crystal, okay? Red dots, uh, sorry, black dots are silicons, and gray region is is, is a silicon dioxide, and the white is air. And uh, now in, in this the band structure corresponding to this uh, photonic crystal is given by this, and we see there are two bands in, uh, highlighted by red. They're kind of you know um, uh, isolated, and uh, uh, there is band gap between the two. So we will use these two band to uh, uh, use these two bands to demonstrate the two band model we we uh, we uh, we considered. Okay, so basically now we want to turn on some uh, modulation in space to couple these two bands together. All right. So the modulation spec the spectral modulation we consider is sort of block wave modulation. Uh, we have three block waves. So what kind of block waves you could have maybe propagating acoustic waves. Okay. So uh, then, these these three block waves they have different uh, different initial phase, right? And their propagation propagation direction is related to the k points uh, 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 of this photon crystal. Okay. So uh, so then you realize this kind of modulation actually induces a periodic modulation in space with the same periodicity as a photonic crystal. So we coin this kind of structure as a flake photonic crystal. It is still a crystal. Uh, uh, has uh, the same periodicity. All right. 
So uh, then we use the AB initial simulation, basically using the MPV package. We are able to calculate uh, the gauge field uh, in real space. This is uh, literally using the uh, MPV package, basically solving the electromagnetic field in, in, in photon crystal and using that to calculate gauge field. So that gives you the gauge field distribution in a space. You realize in wigan size cell, the total magnetic field, uh, uh, this, yeah, this should be magnetic field. So total magnetic field is zero. But nonetheless, uh, uh, there is some magnetic field that is spatially varying. So that means the time reversal symmetry is uh, 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 still bridged in this uh, um, in this lattice, and we are able to calculate the K band structure and calculate the number associated with these uh, bands, and they are indeed non-zero. And uh, these chain number actually can be tuned. They depends on the, they depend on the uh, uh, the phase of these propagating waves. Right, so if you change the propagating waves, the right face of the big propagating waves, you can actually change the chain number. So that's very interesting. So, uh, so eventually, we we are also able to show that uh, this kind of lattice, modulated lattice, can support one-way edge mode. Uh, so this is uh, again AB initial simulation. Literally, this is a, a large uh, structure uh, with a photonic crystal uh, uh, under dynamic modulation, uh, three block of waves. All right, and then we, uh, for certain frequency, we indeed see that there is some uh, 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 one-way edge mode, as you can see here. This is source in the middle, and that as time uh, goes, as this uh, uh, this source emits some uh, uh, one-way edge mode to the left without uh, to the right, All right? And if we introduce some defect on the edge, then this one-way edge mode kind of go around that defect. Okay, so this, uh, of course, you see also see lots of uh, bulk fuse. This is because uh, uh, we do have not, we do not have a complete band gap uh, between the uh, between two flat two two flat band. Okay. So uh, so this is a, a first example of a um, continuous system, um, I believe, um, that shows uh, topological one way edge mode under dynamic modulation. All right. So this kind of conclude uh, what I want to talk about for the uh, dynamically modulated topological system. And uh, um, so next, I want to switch gear a little bit to talk about bound state in the continuum. Uh, um, and that also has some topological flavor uh, with, with itself, right? So the motivation here so is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is for quantum automechanics. So you've heard a lot about automechanics in these in this sessions. So basically, the uh, primary device architecture people use for quantum automechanics is the automechanical cavities, right? So here are three examples. So these cavities, essentially, uh, they need to be released okay, in order to trap uh, long-lived phonons. Right? Intuitively, how do you trap phonons? Of course, you release the structure, such that the photon won't be uh, uh, leaked into the substrate. And indeed, that's uh, uh, what you would need, uh, because the Hamiltonian, automechanical Hamiltonian is given by this equation. You realize, you know, uh, in order to set the like, phase matching condition, this displacement, okay, this b plus b dagger or x, has to have zero momentum, okay? So zero momentum. So zero momentum, stationary mechanical mode, you, you, you have to suspend the structure. You cannot use, uh, you cannot surface the wave because these surface the wave, although confined, they have non-zero momentum. So you cannot use this acoustic wave to couple to optical mode, uh, uh, cavity mode. So you suspended the structure. While that's good for trapping the, uh, coherent, uh, trapping the coherent photon that you need, but nevertheless, then the structure will have a limited heat, heat capacity, right? So, but that's a, a, a heat, heat issue, heating issue becomes uh, you know uh, severe for quantum operations at low temperature when you use a optical parametric pump to uh, to drive this mechanical mode at low temperature. The parametric pump will, uh, with some probability, to induce heat uh, in these structures because the structure is released, the heat cannot uh, be dissipated away in a fast way. Uh, so it's quant many quantum particles will be uh, hindered by these uh, parametric heating issues. So that's our motivation. So the question is that uh, can we trap phonons, especially zero momentum phonons, in a continuum, meaning uh, with the structure is attached to a substrate? So inspired, uh, inspired by a recent, uh, recent emerging concept of bound state in a continuum, we think it is possible uh, using mechanical bound state in the continuum. So in general, bound states in the continuum is uh, um, is basically um, suppose we have a system. Uh, it could be mechanical or optical or any system. Uh, we have a spectrum like this. Blue means the continuum. Uh, for example, light cone. 
uh, above the light cone. And we have some uh, regions that, uh, uh, that have isolated modes. And these could be uh, you know, regular boundary states like resonator, resonator modes. Uh, and uh, typically, people think uh, in the continuum you don't have a, a bound, uh, you don't have bound state. But nevertheless, people realize in recent years that uh, you could have a very spatially localized mode that do not decay or couple into the continuum. So this is called a bound state in the continuum. Okay, so this has been uh, uh, widely studied in the optical field, and uh, uh, and uh, we we realize we think uh, this kind of concept is very useful to solve the problem we, I just mentioned about uh, parametric heating in auto mechanical systems. Okay, so this is a, a, a illustration of the structure we consider. Basically, we can have a slab on substrate structure and we pattern the slab to, uh, uh, in, to be photonic crystal such that it supports uh, BIC phonons. So the BIC phonons won't couple, won't decay uh, in leak into the substrate even though it is attached to the substrate. And uh, however, because now we have a substrate, any, any parasitic phonons such as heat uh, generated in this slab can be easily decayed into, into the substrate, okay? So that uh, uh, potentially will help with the opto, opto, experiment, uh, uh, opto mechanical experiments at the cryogenic temperatures. So then we carry out this design and uh, uh, experiment work. And uh, this is specific structure with this kind of uh, 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 cross uh, uh, cross the unit cell, and uh, this is shown the numerical calculated band structure. And at a gamma point, at a gamma point mean kx k is zero. That's exactly what the, the mechanical model we want to couple with the optical uh, field. So we've identified three BIC mo mechanical mode, and uh, uh, they are they they do not couple into the trip actually because they have a sort of a special symmetry that is not consistent, is not uh, uh, considered with uh, a radiation field. So they won't couple into radiation field. And if you look at deeper into that, you analyze the uh, uh, far field, you know, uh, transverse polarization of these uh, uh, BIC mode, you, you find they actually have some winding number associated with them. So we call them uh, topological charges. So that's, that's uh, how the topological concept enters into this BIC uh, physics, okay? So they have topological charges, and for radiation field, they, they, they have topological charge zero, but for the BIC mode, they have non-zero topological charge, so they will not couple into the radiation field. So, uh, so then we uh, fabricated the design structure, okay, in aluminum nitride on uh, oxide uh, microchips. We use aluminum nitride because then we can use piezoelectricity to excite these, uh, uh, to probe this phenomenal crystal. Okay, so indeed, uh, we uh, perform this experiment in, at both temperature and uh, both room temperature and the cryogenic temperatures. And uh, uh, here shows the uh, 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 cryogenic temperature a spectroscopy of this uh, phonon crystal. And we can identify a group of B1 mode. So B1, B1 mode is one type of the BIC, uh, one, one of the three BIC mode I mentioned before. And we can characterize the quality factor of this uh, mode. And uh, uh, we, we identify at, uh, for this structure, for this uh, device, this uh, uh, quality factor is limited by the, radi uh, the radiation uh, Q. As I mentioned, the BIC, ideally BIC do not have any radiation, but for fabricated devices, because of the fabric structure, it breaks the symmetry of the structure. So these uh, BIC will have some leakage in the substrate. But uh, uh, if, as we improve the fabrication and make the, uh, make the structure larger, we are expected to have a much higher uh, radiation, radiation uh, uh, quality factor, okay? So this is just for uh, the, the first work to demonstrate the mechanical BIC. Of course, in the future, in the, for the next work, we are gonna try to couple uh, uh, this mechanical BIC with optical guided resonance and to do um, uh, do optical mechanical experiments, right? So this is just one example as we showed in this paper. Uh, we can indeed have strongly coupled mechanical BIC and optical guided resonances. And uh, the advantage of this structure, as I mentioned, besides this the heat capacity, uh, uh, the BI, mechanical BIC have gigahertz uh, frequency, so just as uh, optical crystal nanobeams, so high frequency, so uh, you can cool it, passively cool it down to quantum ground state at uh, uh, millikelvin temperature. And the coupling between this mechanical BIC and the optical guided resonance is actually pretty hard, pretty high. It's uh, 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 over one megahertz per unit cell. And, uh, and this structure uh, do not, we do not use any cavity structure, right? It's uh, basically a 2D uniform Crystal, optical crystal without any cavity, 
So it essentially can be scaled to a larger size, microscope size. So, uh, so imagine if we are able to achieve, if we are able to work in the quantum regime, then eventually we will enter the macroscopic quantum regime, uh, hopefully to uh, reduce some interesting uh, effects there. So, uh, so that pretty much ends my talk. So this uh, uh, the, the work done in my group involves these graduate students and I appreciate the funding agencies. Um, so with that, I want to thank you for your attention and uh, uh, welcome any question. Thank you for this very exciting talk, Keisha. We already had one question in the chat for, by Paloma. Do you want to unmute yourself um, and ask it yourself? Otherwise, I'll start asking for a few seconds. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, thanks for the nice talk. So I have a question, or well, two questions <laughs> regarding the flock photon crystal. So the first one is why do you choose that particular geometry to start off uh, before you apply the temporal modulation? Is it in order to have two isolated bands? Uh, right, so uh, we do realize uh, um, this, uh, um, to show some interesting fact, do we have some sort of well, uh, isolated bands like one and two here? That's true. Uh, that's why we okay. designed this kind of HC. Okay, I see. And then the second is why? Why is, is it not enough to modulate the the whole photonic crystal as a whole, like with a uniform, um, spatially uniform temporal modulation? In other words, why do you need to input these three waves from different sides ah. to create interference? Yeah, I see. Yeah, so that's a good question. So basically, is I want to the key the, what breaks the time symmetry is actually these uh, modulation phase phi j. If I only have one phi, then essentially this will can be gauged away. I at, I, I at least need two phi, basically two, mm -hmm. two modulation uh, propagating waves to in, in uh, to break time reversal symmetry. Okay, uh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, actually, I have one more question that I would like to ask. And uh, I'm familiar with bound states in the continuum from the systems with emitters, coupled and waveguides, uh, including retardation. I was wondering how that relates to what you call bound states in the continuum. Is it the same concept? Because you said it's symmetry induced, and in the other mm -hmm. concept, I don't see symmetry. Right. Um, so, so, well, I. I what do you mean by the emitters, the bound state in, in, in emitters? I thought I thought you you knew, like I mean maybe maybe you just talk, say bound state in a continuum because literally it's a bound state whose frequency is in the continuum. In the continuum, right? No, there, there's there's other works. Um, also, Shan Huifan worked on them, so I thought you might be familiar. Which it's like there's a there's an emitter on a waveguide and a mirror at the end. And then, if you space the uh, emitter at exactly the right distance from the from the mirror, you can you get a photon um, atom bound state is also ah. in the band of this ah. thing. But it relies on retardation effects and non markovianity of the bath, whereas here you rely on symmetry. So it seems different, but I guess it's fair. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I guess the, the concept is pretty similar, but the uh, mechanisms might be different. Uh, here, yeah. I just focus on is this kind of microscopic, large size, yeah, symmetry induced uh, BIC. Yes. OK, yeah, that makes sense. Cool. So I don't see any more questions, actually. Um, so I think with that, I would like to thank Keija and, and, and all the speakers of the session again for this uh, very cool um, talks. Uh, I'd like to thank all the people that ask questions and maybe the organizers want to say something at the end to close off the day. I don't know. Okay, if nobody's saying something, thank you all for attending. <laughs> and yeah, I think it was a great day. I, Geo, I hope you think so too. And I hope to see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. See you tomorrow. Have a nice evening. <laughs>